welcomes our citizens' comment and it's, uh, your comments. It's very, uh, it is my goal to make uh, these meetings run smoothly and efficiently in order for the government to be effective. In this vein, I ask everyone to follow the rules of the body as directed by the chair. I also ask that you please assist me in keeping order in this room during uh, this deliberative process so that our uh, citizens' time, including those watching on TV, and our time is not fruitless. When I give a warning about time limits or request an order, I ask that you observe it. You have three minutes to speak, and uh, when you hear the buzzle, buzzer, uh, that means that it's, your time has uh, expired, but I will allow you to wrap up your last sentence. Mr. Pierce, come forth for me this morning, and please state your address and your subject matter is Corridor in the Fine. <coughs> Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Madam Chair and fellow council people, and a few people as I was coming out of the courtroom, hello to y'all for watching and thank you for watching Channel 23. Appreciate it. Uh, Sorry I missed the last meeting, got my dates mixed up, but what that caused me to do is to compress my thoughts into three minutes and I'm getting hard of hearing that bell. All right, there's something here I want to read. No, I know okay. three minutes didn't go by that fast. No, that wasn't. That so, wasn't. I am not going to the funeral home. Yes. Yes. All right. There's something here I just thought give y'all a moment to think. There's a vehicle policy here. It was written by the coroner. It's called 9-1-A. Now, in the book of the policy, you, you, first off, you got to understand what policies are for. Policies are make sure that everybody's on the same page because they don't seem to get along about what the rules are. So policy 91A is hers. Whole page. I'm not going to read the whole thing. And I've read it many times, but here's, here's something. Reasonable judgment must be exercised in the use of county vehicles for personal purposes. Well, all you got to do is say reasonable use or judgment. Now, got to read this book here, Who Owns Death? <coughs> Not what you think about very much. But somewhere in November, the coroner asked for 21,000, might have been 25, I'm not sure, but it was 20,000 plus for indigence. Let me tell you what indigents are. Someone that doesn't own property, doesn't have much, lucky to even have a family. A real indigent is somebody who is found out on the road. All right, she asked for 20-some thousand, and at the time she asked for it, it was November. Now, if you divide 36 up to that time she had it, which was an average of 36 in two years before, Actually, 33 and 16, 36 and 17, 36 and 18. Coming out to about three a month. So let's just say six. Six and 36 is 32. I mean, 42. But actually, it was 41. So the question I have as a citizen is if you got 20 some thousand dollars and you buried five, it leaves about 15,000 left over. I don't think it was returned to the coffer. Don't know really where it went. So what I'm trying to say is that. You ask, y'all in dealing, you always ask for more than you need. Children learn that from parents. So, Madam Chair, I'm here this morning to say that you are our leader, and as a chairperson, you're to oversee everything the council does. And as such, 
I would like to hear more input when things are debatable and things are done. And the way I know Rule Robert Rules of Order, been a long time since I was in high school as vice president. But I remember a whole bunch of times Eddie Sampei, who was Japanese president of our student council, said, Larry, you take the chair because I got something to say. Right. And he did. And when he got through saying it, he'd say, Larry, move out of my chair. And his name was Eddie Sampei. So I don't know much about a lot of things, but I tell you what, I learn things from people that know a lot more than me. And it's time to step up to the plate because a guy coming out of the courthouse the other day, I was in front of him, had a Harley Davidson jacket on, I'm gonna finish this sentence, looked like a bearded guy that drove a Harley. And he worked for the county. And he said, are you Larry Pierce? I mean, I thought for a minute he was gonna slam me. <laughs> he said, I said, yeah. He said, I appreciate watching you on our channel. He said, you say things that others think. And he said, you say things that others wish to go up here and say. And I said, why don't you start coming up here and saying what you think? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce, for taking this matter under advisement. I do have a response for you yes, today. Uh, we have, I'm going to allow you to sit. No. You sit? We have zero based bud budgeting, and you know what that means? If it's not spent, it rolls back into our coffers anyway. So, zero based budgeting. You have several types of budgeting, and then I'll be happy to meet with you to talk about those. You have uh, volume based budgets, things are based on volumes, and then you have the zero base. Zero base means it's just going to roll back into the coffers anyway if they don't spend it. So, okay, so we'll talk about that. I'll be more than willing right. to sit down and have a budgetary conversation with you because that's my strong suit. Pretty I'll sure. Be your student, I'll guarantee you. Yes. No. Okay, you can chat. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson said you have a comment. Yeah, I don't mind. Just for clarity, because again, first year, beginning of the year, clarity. Um, Director Hallman, um, this matter came up in our finance committee in which uh, we we anticipated, not the coroner, the finance committee anticipated um, uh, based on projection of where um, it, um, cremations and all that was coming. How do we approach that process real quick? Too? We looked at the uh, prior year trends on um, pauper funerals. Yes. Those uh, that was the ex expenditure line that we were looking at to see um, <clears throat> how much money the coroner would need to cover uh, current and to the end of the year pauper funerals. Okay. And and now we won't belabor this to Madam Chair's point. We can take it offline. But but mm -hmm. one of our jobs in, in finance is to anticipate. Um, there is accounting which you look backward, but but we we believe that we should be able to forecast the future to a certain extent. Right? We can't predict predict it accurately, but we at least can anticipate it. So what we try to do is that, what we know is that we are going to have paupers and we're going to pay our bills. Right? People are going to die. And so some of this conversation was about, you know, well, should we do it? Should we pay, um, should we pay for it? And I think our goal was just try to anticipate and whatever we don't spend, we do what? We roll it back? Correct. Mm -hmm. So I want to clarify that, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I yield the floor. Okay. Commissioner Guy. <clears throat> Just one point, it's not done by line item. So if you're over in this line item up here, but you're, uh, say, under <coughs> this line item up here, and <coughs> under, over this line item down here, it offsets the final tally. So she could be over in cremations, I mean, under in cremations, have excess money, okay? But she could also overspend in gas and oil. Just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll move on to the next uh, item. But I, I want to wrap it up too because I have a final comment in order. If you have more depth, you're going to use more gas and oil, <coughs> and so that's that's required to do so. One thing that I didn't want to do, and I've been in healthcare. I spent 40 years in healthcare. And you cannot predict that. Uh, life is still uh, life is is a miracle. And death is just inevitable, and you can't predict it. And I said that I would take care of the citizens of Douglas County from sunrise to sunset, and I'm going to do that. And whatever it takes to require to to pay the off to offset that cost if it if, if it exceeds the budget, the board of commissioners, I feel that we should step up to the plate and pay for these citizens that uh, the ones that can't afford to pay for their own funerals, proper funerals, and what have you. But we will continue. We'll take this conversation offline. Uh, you cannot predict death. That's just one thing that I don't toy with is death. 
Next, we'll go to our next item. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. I'll take your matter under advisement at a later time, and me and you can have our own personal meeting. And now I'm going to move on to presentations. We have a presentation from our tax commissioner, uh, Mr. Greg Baker. Please come forward. I love the presentation. It <laughs> clarifies some things. And, well, good morning. Good morning. I want to clarify some items in my budget. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is not a complaint session, not to call anybody out, but it's to clarify things and move forward from there. Um, back a little while ago in the paper, it said that I received 200,000 discretionary funds. And also it went out in their newsletter. And I would like to say that's not true. I don't know how they got their information or where they got their information, but I have a copy of my budget here. And I would be happy to sit with them and go over my budget. Who is them? Uh, tax commissioner. Mm -hmm. You say them. Who is them? Mrs. Geithner. Okay. I would be happy to sit with you and go over my budget. I don't know where those funds are, but if I were supposed to get them, I would love to find them. Uh, I would like to see us sit down sometime before stuff goes out in the news and on your <coughs> newsletter. If you'd love to sit down with me, anything comes out of the tax office, I'd be happy to sit down with you. I do it with a lot of people. People come by all the time, sit down with me. You've been there. I don't know where you got that 200,000 discretionary funds, but my understanding of discretionary is once you guys approve the budget, each department use their funds at their own discretion. And they have their own line items and they stay within those line items. And if they go out, they can come back and ask for additional funds or move money around. But, you know, in my department, you guys gave us a great building over there, and we enjoy it. We're still working on some stuff over there. We're still missing some backroom stuff. Let me show you my accounting system. This is my accounting system today, steel. This is how we do our accounting, and these big, large ledgers. We need accounting software. That is what some of the stuff I asked for in my budget. Now, whether I get there, because I didn't get the budget that I wanted to get out of this type of system, and this was here there when you were there. So I'd like to answer that. <laughs> well, you will. You'll get a chance. Uh, but we need accounting software. We need to move forward into the <coughs> new century. I think these were done back when the Flintstones first came out. Uh, if you remember the Flintstones, some of the people here do. But we need to move forward and go beyond that, but I'm just clarifying things and wanted to say, love to work with you, but no, I did not get 200,000 in discretionary fund in my budget. Okay. No, question. May, may I ask a question for me? Yes, <coughs> Commissioner Guida. The discretionary fund was on the sheet that was handed out to the commissioner. Okay. And uh, that ledger right there is a one line, it's just your bank account. You've got QuickBooks Pro that does the the disbursements and everything. That is just one line line item to show the balance of your um, account. And the auditor liked it so well, he put every county he audited on it. So just want to say And we're that. still using it today, he liked it. So but, but you do still have like QuickBooks, QuickBooks Pro. Pro. You know how old our QuickBooks Pro is? Well, it, you get the updates every yeah. year. It's over the counter, so it's very cheap. And that's still backwards for what we're doing nowadays. What you did back in those days that we're not doing anymore. We're doing it totally different in that tax commissioner office. We have a lot more things that we need to do that the Department of Revenue has thrown on us. And you should know that because you guys approved a budget for us to go forward and buy the new equipment. So it's a lot more detailed things that we're doing nowadays. So QuickBook Pro does not work. Most, most counties now have BPN which is an accounting software that does a lot more. And if you want to check with those counties, you'll see that that's what they're using out there. So times have changed a little bit. The county is growing. It's getting bigger, whether we like it or not, and we need to move forward. So I appreciate it. That's all I have to say. And if you'd like to go over that budget, I'll be happy to go over it. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Any questions? Any you questions? I'm sorry. Commissioners? OK. Thank you so much, <coughs> Thank commissioners. you. Board of Commissioners, you have the minutes for tomorrow. Please, I ask that you take a look at these minutes and be prepared to approve accordingly tomorrow. Uh, please, for me. 
um, business items. Next, we have our business items and <coughs> we'll move into tab number four. Tab number four is authorization <coughs> to approve a contract with Judicial Alternatives of Georgia Incorporation JAG for misdemeanor minor, uh, probation services for state court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Judge Barker. He is walking over now, so if you want okay. to go to the next one. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Okay, tab number five, authorization to approve a contract with GTG Traffic Signals LLC in the amount of $47,932. Uh, for the installation of a railroad early warning signals at the intersection of Connors Road and Mirror Lake Boulevard and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents except full reimbursement from the city of Villa Rica for the design and construction of the project per intergovernmental agreement and amend the budget and subject to final legal review, Director Miguel Valentino. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. And good morning. morning. Uh, this is a, a project uh, that's been under design, under discussion for probably several years, under design for at least uh, a year, not a little longer. And it is uh, it was advertised. Uh, there were four bids, and the lowest bid is the four, uh, forty-seven thousand nine hundred thirty-two dollars. It's within uh, the estimated amount uh, that, that we had anticipated. It is fully reimbursable by the city of Villa Rica, and there is an agreement between the county and the city for uh, that uh, funding to be reimbursed. Okay, thank you so much, Director Bellantin. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Guider. Yes, uh, Miguel, I'm glad to see this go forward and I know people in Mirror Lake will <laughs> because they have to go down the railroad track and then they have to turn around because there's a railroad uh, train sitting on it. <clears throat> now who will maintain this? Well the, the responsibility for maintenance of signals uh, would rest with the city however uh, there is an interagency agreement between the county and the city. Uh, so if there's any <clears throat> any immediate uh, maintenance needs that we can attend to, then uh, we would respond to that, but we would be reimbursed uh, for our expenditure. Well, I'm just so happy that this is going forward. We've been dealing with this for several years, and I appreciate the chairman and her uh, intervention also, but uh, and the legislators. And um, <coughs> they, dealing with the railroad has not been easy, <laughs> to say the least. But thank you for um, what you've done here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. <coughs> and thank you so much, Director Valentin. This has been a long process, a two-year, uh, almost three-year process. But thank mm -hmm. you. We appreciate you. <coughs> That's all for now. Um, James. <coughs> Is he here, Judge Barker? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just keep going. Mm -hmm. I have another one for you, Director mm -hmm. Valentin. Tab number six: authorization to allocate eleven thousand. Oh, sorry, eleven million. Yes. For eleven million for the Lee Road Widening Project. P one zero 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 four four two eight and one million dollars for lights and sidewalks from the 2016 uh, SWAS as recommended by the Transportation Committee. Director Valentin again. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, at the last uh, Transportation Committee, there was uh, some discussion about uh, reprioritizing the SPLOS projects based on where we are, how much progress we've made, which projects have been funded or an allocation made uh, towards their construction or design. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there was a project, uh, as part of that process, there was a project for uh, <coughs> Urban Road and Anna Wakey that had been estimated at six million dollars. Uh, it was intended to be a, a, a realignment of the roads and uh, essentially the discussion went along the lines of that was probably a project that uh, could be deferred uh, at this time. Uh, it was getting to be too expensive and it was probably would have taken uh, uh, quite a bit of, of the allocation of funding for that type of project. So. As part of that discussion, the committee recommended that you know, that project be eliminated from the list and uh, the $6 million in funding from that line item in the SPLOS be allocated $5 million from that uh, to the Lee Road widening project 
and uh, as you mentioned, the one million towards uh, lights and sidewalks and safety projects. Uh, so that <clears throat> that accounts for uh, part of the allocation. <coughs> the, uh, the additional allocation of uh, uh, six million dollars would come from the economic development component of uh, SPLOST. Uh, the the uh, there is uh, some projects, or there are a, a, a few projects in that area that uh, we are anticipating that we would move forward with. However, based on a number of uh, developments, uh, <coughs> several data centers that went into the area, Factory Shoals and Douglas Hill, and <clears throat> as a result, they have done some uh, road widening uh, as part of their projects. And so uh, the, the expectation is that we would be able to accomplish uh, quite a bit of what was anticipated in that area uh, by having all of these projects basically do it their uh, pro rata share of the improvement. So uh, the, uh, the recommendation is in order to move the Lee Road Whiting project forward to take six million out of that uh, allocation for economic development uh, initially was a total of 10 million and with this uh, six million dollar allocation there's about 2.2 about .2 million remaining for the projects that we anticipate moving as part of that component so as you know uh, we've had uh, a number of discussions about the lee road widening project and what is required to move that forward the project has been certified for construction by gdot uh, it was ready to go with the exception of the funding component. Uh, uh, there is uh, a discussion that we still need to have with the Georgia DOT to make sure that they are lining up their contribution to the project so that with this allocation, uh, if, it, if it is approved uh, going forward, uh, with this allocation plus the federal funding that we are anticipating we would still receive, we would be able to move the project, get it to construction and finish it. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Vice Chairman Robson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Real quick, it, I'm going to make some statements, Miguel, and then I'll, I'll, I'll yield back. Uh, you know, as chairman of the Transportation Committee, this is one of those projects we, we really had to take a look at. Uh, we, we're two years into this lost, and um, after looking at it, it was like, okay, do we really want to spend that amount of money on this and we weren't going to really get perhaps a return on it that we anticipated? Um, as you know, the Lee Road Bridge project is something that's been strategic online for what, how long? Um, since I came into office? Since um, 2003. Okay, LCI, or oh, 2003, I came in in 09. It's been around a long time. Um, we, we shouldn't have lost the financing um, like we lost it during the uh, economy. We won't, we won't recreate history. But the project was, it was visionary. I, I give um, Commissioner Moe here, who sort of um, was, was primary the architect of this. Um, it cuts across all four commission districts, so I know sometimes we hear commentary why so much in District 2. Uh, I had no problem of acquiescing to say where the priority should be on this one. Um, I appreciate the committee stepping up and unanimously passed this to say, okay, well, if I had to reallocate this money, I obviously don't want it to go out the district, but nonetheless, uh, where, where can it benefit all of us? Mr. Mitchell, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. you're next up as it relates to sort of the Lee Road going reverse way. Right. Um, Commissioner Carthen, you inherited the connect point of, of Beaumont, ultimately Chapel Hill, and of course, we'll eventually get around to 78. So as it relates to sort of um, how you take that concentration of dollars, how, how does it benefit everybody, all four commission districts? So we had to talk about this, we had to think about it, and I think we had a, gr a great public debate. Uh, I'd encourage anybody to go back and take a look at that tape. Um, nothing, you know, astronomical, but, but nonetheless, it was important. Um, a couple of things, though, um, I want you to talk about. Um, five million, say it one more time, five million um, out of um, this allocation in this BOSS project, which was defined. Six million dollars out of economic development out of the 10 million that was undefined. Is that accurate? That is to come correct. up with our contribution. That is correct. Five plus six equals 11. What is the total cost of this project? <coughs> it's uh, 21 million. 21 million. All right, and where is the, the balance of that coming from? Well, that is a discussion that we have to have with GDOT. Uh, they initially had the funding uh, allocated in 2019, uh, 2018, I'm sorry. 
and, and because we didn't have the funding locally, uh, they moved the project out to, to the year 2023, so something that they do whenever they <coughs> cannot advance a project. And uh, the discussion is going to be, now that the county has uh, an allocation of funding to be able to move the project forward, we would have them uh, bring the project back into the TIF uh, Transportation Improvement Program uh, in fiscal year 2020, which begins in July of this year. Okay. <coughs> Stay right here. So let's back up real quick, but just for the context. So how much was it going to cost back in 2013? How much was it originally? Just for the public. Do you know roughly? I know this is before you. Yeah, it w uh, the first estimate that I saw uh, when I came online here was 12 million. 12 million total. Total. All right, so now it costs us in our <coughs> administration 21 million. That's a big jump, right? For us to have to go back and rebuild history. Miguel, I appreciate you getting this back on track. I'm not going to belabor this, but because of the dollar amount, we've got to spend the time to have this public conversation. <coughs> All right, that being said, we. Um, Madam Chair, you hosted, uh, along with the commissioners of GDOT earlier this year, or in the late last year in essence, we actually brought this up as a topic. And because we did lose the funding, basically Miguel had the, the, the task of going back and trying to get this refinanced, to get it back on track. All right, so I want to make sure I'm clear on this, that this allocation that we're going to do here that's on the agenda is only contingent upon if the state is coming to the table. Because in other words, we're going to the table and say, look, we got money locally, we got cash. Moving from 2023 back up to 2020, we want to move on this because we've been waiting a long time. Can you clarify it? So what if they don't? I mean, again, the money, clarify what we're really saying here. If the state doesn't come back in a reasonable amount of time, <coughs> we as a commission have to still spend this money. All right, so where's our window on the other side of this that says I want to set expectations and just can't sit there forever? Can you clarify for us? Understood. Uh, the process for... Uh, moving projects from one year to another or uh, perhaps from early in the year towards the later part of a year happens four times a year. So quarterly there is an opportunity to sort of reshuffle the project list. Uh, part of that is a request either to move a project out to a future year or to bring it back in. And it is a discussion between the local uh, agency the, the ARC, Atlanta Regional Commission. Uh, in this particular case, it would also be uh, Greta, because Greta was a sort of a guarantor of the initial funding, which is what we're trying to get uh, moved and allocated and turned into <coughs> real funds uh, for the project to move forward. So what would happen if this is approved is I would, I would pursue a, a meeting with uh, uh, the Georgia Department of Transportation and Commissioner uh, McMurray. Uh, I would also meet with the Atlanta Regional Commission and I would meet with uh, Greta again, or CERTA now, and have the discussion. Uh, now, I've done that before in terms of we need this funding to be resurrected. Now, uh, I have would have the ability, if this is approved, to say, we have the local match. Uh, we need you to step up and uh, line this, the funding that was originally uh, earmarked for this project uh, to, and then to bring it up to the year, fiscal year 2020, which begins July 1st of 2020. Okay, my, my last point, so I can yield the floor. To that point, um, if you think about Lee Road from just my district's <coughs> perspective, I mean, think about it. Thornton Road has been repaved, uh, Riverside has been repaved, Fairburn Road has been repaved. The Lee Road, which is the second busiest street, second to Thornton Road, as a cut through, has uh, so many potholes and we're trying to maintain it. And I've been deferring and deferring and deferring, um, obviously coming through a recession, but at the same point, anticipating that we're going to have the funding to get this widened. Um, but it's also recognized that we're resurfacing this, right? So I'm going to come back to that. But five million, that one million is left over. Please speak to that again. I heard what operational improvements, lights, Street, sidewalks, sidewalks. Um, not six, just in District Two, but throughout. How, right. how? What was the committee say? What did they say? Well, one one of the uh, one of the items that we talked about. There were, there were some intersections that had been um, uh, targeted for improvement, but there was no funding allocation. For example, State Route 92 and Mount Vernon. There there was a request for 
traffic signal that we've been pursuing, and we still are, but there is no specific allocation for, for that intersection. Uh, there is going to be a component of the cost that is going to fall on the county. We, we have not identified the full amount yet, uh, but things like that would be traffic signals, uh, <coughs> or at least uh, are matched in traffic signals. It would be street lights, wherever they're needed. Uh, it could be a guardrail that's needed at a, a particular location. So safety improvements that would be uh, required, um, and, and it could be uh, wherever the board uh, sees fit to, uh, to approve. Madam Chair, are you for this decision? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Geiger? Yes, um, Lee Road certainly does need <coughs> widening. I know that. Uh, and it's been in the plans for many, many years. Um, and I have been told by someone at the state level that it's the money, although it laps as far as our request, it can easily be put back on the table. So more than likely we will be getting funding from GDOT. Uh, this year uh, there's paving money in the either the LMIG or the SPLOSH paving program <coughs> to pay it. What happens to that money? Do we put it on hold to see what the state's going to do? I, I would not recommend you do that because what uh, <laughs> the way we strat uh, strategize that improvement is we would have had to go back um, if we were going to do a straight overlay on that road and <clears throat> rework the plans based on the new elevation. So what we're doing as part of the resurfacing is scarifying the surface that's there down to a couple inches and putting it back so that whatever, whatever funding we spend on the resurfacing will be utilized almost entirely as part of the new project. Now, it be used as an offset. Not uh, as, an off uh, as far as our match. It, not necessarily. <coughs> it, what uh, what would have happened is before the contractor could do the final top on the project after the widening, they would have had to go in and repair the <coughs> road, the existing road as part of that of the project. In this particular case, because we're doing it as part of the LMIG and SPLOST uh, funding, that surface would be able to be overlaid as part of the project and utilized without spending the, fu the additional funds uh, out of that, uh, out of the project itself. The 11 million, is that our match? Or is yeah. that the total cost? No, that's project? our match. <clears throat> that's our match, and it would take uh, 11 million to get GDOT to bring their funds to the table. That is the gap. That is uh, the commitment, or, or that is the uh, the gap in funding between their original allocation and the estimated cost of the project. So. It would take that much to be able to say, if you if you uh, basically come back with all of the funding that was allocated for this project that was moved out, and then uh, we have the funding to be able to have the 21 million that's needed to move the project forward. So, how much? What's the percentage of our match then? <laughs> It's, it's 21 million, 11 million, that's about half of it. Well, it, it is, and, and it's unfortunately... Why would it not be 20%? Well, 20% is uh, the goal that uh, when, when you first start out with the project. <clears throat> and if the final cost would have been 12 million total, then it would have been closer to the 20%. The problem is that when you start a project that is designed over a long period of time, there's escalation in cost. And when you start, when you initially develop the preliminary estimates for projects, you don't have all of the details. You don't have a lot of the details that go to the cost component. And so you, you develop a um, what's called a planning level estimate and that was what was allocated, or, or uh, that was the estimate of 12 million. It was a, a planning level estimate. 
that when the plans were finalized and the details were uh, developed, then uh, it became obviously uh, 21 million. Um, what will um, voting for this 11 million? What will that do to the projects that's already on this list and the priority in which they're set? The the because uh, it's last, it's last on this list. <laughs> Well, that, that project, um, the, the allocation of six, uh, initially six million, um, would allow all the other, pro the projects that have been funded to date are still fully funded as part of the I'm spot. concerned about the ones that have not been funded yet, uh, such as uh, the left, the right turn lane on Highway 5. That's my priority. I know this is his priority, but this is my priority for right. the people on Highway 5. Understood. Right turn lane on Highway 5 is ahead of Panawake and 92. It right. comes on the list before that, so that funding would come. That funding is there. That's what I'm saying. What will this do to the priority list that we have already? Will it fall at the bottom, uh, at the end of the list? And maybe be moved up if we get money from the state? 92 and Fairburn Road, I mean, Fairburn Road and Anawake is not at the bottom. It's... It's next to the bottom. Yeah, but there's, there's items below that. Well, only only the ones that are, are iffy. Yes. Yeah. As far as being funded to begin with. But it wouldn't affect the ones above. It was the last priority. It was the last priority. It wouldn't affect the ones above. So we will get these above it before we... Uh, fund this unless the state comes no, in no, not necessarily explain please <laughs> no if the state I mean if we commit this then it's committed you know, well, not to the top of the list but whatever it, it, it's getting done I'm, I'm yeah. going to jump in but it, it, yeah. yes is it jeopardizing any of the projects on the list that we already have the ones above it based on the cost <coughs> estimates we have now no it would not the, the ones that have been funded and are in process either design or some of them getting ready to go to construction in the spring, it doesn't impact those, but there was a pretty lengthy list. So obviously it, it, this allocation would uh, capture the funding that, that would have gone to go all the way down the list. So at some point it's going gonna, it's gonna to not allow us to go any further on the list. But not the priority list. Not the priority list, no. Not those priority. projects are, the allocation has been made, this would not impact those projects. Well, um, and the only problem I, I really see here is, it just seems like we're using that 10 million economic development for <coughs> things that it was not really intended to be used for. I thought it was gonna be used mainly for the uh, Thornton Road um, industrial park and all that. What's going to happen if we don't have that funding and we need a road in there or need a bridge in there or something? Well, the, there's still um, unallocated funds. We have projects that we are anticipating moving forward with, um, but there's $2.2 million in, that have not been allocated to a specific project. And, and our, our intent mm -hmm. would be to move those projects <coughs> forward uh, for example, Factory Shoals and Douglas Hill, uh, that uh, corridor <coughs> needs to be upgraded and a lot of the work, as I mentioned earlier, is being done by the developers that are going in. However, there are gaps, uh, so, so the county would have to go in and fill in those gaps, make sure that the entire corridor is What well, is the 10 million that was originally allocated for economic development for that area? I just don't want to use up what we had in other intentions <coughs> for. Um, and economic development to me is not just paving roads and widening the roads. So uh, it, it's almost become a slush fund, <laughs> excuse the, the terminology, um, for pet projects. So uh, I, I understand the need for widening the road. 
because it is highly tra trafficked. And we, the overall plan is to have an arc that goes around uh, to get people to the western side, hopefully one day if I live long enough. <laughs> but uh, I just don't want it to interfere with my priority for my side of the county because it's badly needed. Uh, when we had GDOT out here, we didn't even visit Highway 5, and everybody in this room knows what Highway 5 is. So uh, uh, I talked to someone while I was on that trip, and I said, it's a shame we didn't go to Highway 5 to see the congestion there. So, uh, and that's a main artery for <coughs> going to the mall, you know, the, the and, but uh, I just don't want it to interfere with um, the projects that we have on this priority list. Uh, I have a little problem with <coughs> taking money from the economic development because I feel like somewhere down the road we're going to need that for some something that is very needed as far as economic development. But um, this is a lot of money to be shifting around at this time. Uh, but um, with that, I'll go back. Thank well, you. All of Thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Commissioner. All the original <coughs> discussions um, when we were going through the splice projects with the Citizen Project Selection Committee um, and when we met with the, the public on uh, 8 to 10 uh, meetings on the splice, the economic development portion included Lee Road, Fairburn Road area, and the Thornton Road area. So they were both discussed from the beginning. Now, the actual percentages on how much money went to which one was not. That has not been decided. But they were both included. Okay. Love that. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Gardner. Um, Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you have a comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, and again, I, I appreciate the commentaries, but um, when we were going to Wall Street, I'm going to go back to uh, when the county administrator <coughs> put forth the list to go to the, the bonding and so forth. Some of this wasn't defined. And, and, I, and while I appreciate the commentary about priorities, well, this administration has chosen to think through things, not be dealt its hand, not to sort of like, okay, whatever the administration says. So as a commission and as uh, we are chairs of our own specific committees, it's important that we look at, we, we challenge it and say, okay, that might have been the moment that we went to Wall Street to pitch the bonds. We're two years in now. And we're like, okay, now let's rethink this. It's not rigid. They have the right to make decisions that says, okay, let's recalibrate this. All right, so we know that Riverside, it was on the list. But we're trying to justify the $70 million spend. We're into this thing, and I'm looking at this, okay, now why am I spending this money to realign this? You got a light right there at 92 and 160, you know, old Lower River Road, and a wakey. It's like, and you gonna realign this whole road that just got cut, that we just resurfaced? So, the question simply came, let's, let's reprioritize this. As it relates to economic development, um, I, I mean, I appreciate it. I mean, we've got eight data centers over in the Thornton Road area. I mean, of course, if I wanted to be that way, my priority, I would have pushed all the money over there, but that wasn't the point. The point was to be more thoughtful about how, if we did reallocate this, what would get us the most bang for our buck. We went back and cleaned up stuff from the prior <coughs> administration that um, fumbled on financing. No problems. We're trying, to, we're trying to redo some things, right? We're trying to get this right, and I thought it was the most thoughtful way to approach this, but, but but think about it. The economic development, even the $10 million in economic development, remember we came through a recession, we thank the public for giving us an opportunity for this because it had it not been passed, we wouldn't be in this conversation. So at, at the speed in which we moved and, and getting that referendum, the public um, approved it, there was an economic development component. We had we couldn't even we couldn't even anticipate because we were coming through a recession that okay what will we use this money for? Right? Um, if Chris Pumphrey is here, I'd like for him to speak to what the Lee Road stands for as it relates to economic development, just briefly, because this is just not some random resurfacing at, at $10, $10 million, right? This is this, this not, not what this was, $21 million. We're trying to clean up the past, but also to anticipate the future. So Chris, can you speak just briefly, because we've got to move on. Can you speak briefly of why we're doing this, that it's just not a, a glorified uh, resurfacing project, uh, please? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Actually. Good morning. Probably if we had reversed um, item six and seven, probably would have made a lot more sense. Okay. Um, that will kind of help guide the discussion. Um, 
we really put a, a significant focus on development along Fairburn Road and more particularly around the intersection of Lee Road uh, in 92, uh, Lee Road and Fairburn Road, mm -hmm. uh, to that point, uh, which is what we'll discuss in um, the, the next item, is the Lee Road area study. Um, we are positioning property there for economic development purposes, moving towards uh, <coughs> Uh, our target sectors, professional services, technology, mixed use development taking place at that intersection. Um, however, without that, without this widening project taking place, it kind of puts that development on an island. And so, whereas we're not necessarily in the, the lane of paving roads for economic development, but without the widening of the road, it leads towards future economic development. Uh, purposes. So the four laning of Fairburn Road is already in place. The four laning of Lee Road is essential, but the also essential <coughs> piece is the continuing of Lee Road um, through that arc. Uh, uh, like I said, without that access to um, Lee Road and I-20 and that widening, it, it, um, it hinders our ability to <coughs> develop, develop property. Okay. Any, any questions for me? Okay, thank I, you. So I just have one. You want Chris to stay up there? Oh, no, no. Okay. okay. I, I, mean, that's, I mean, that's what I was going to ask him that to come back and actually kind of enhance us on the, that, that conversation that we had a while back. But, but to you, Miguel, is, I just want to speak on the $1 million that you spoke about um, that's going to uh, help with the um, uh, uh, curb and gutter and sidewalks and so on. Wasn't that a million dollars that you spoke of on that end? Or am I lost in my math when we said something about, about uh, <coughs> what I what I think I mentioned was safety improvements. So, so it would be uh, street lights. Uh, oh, that's right. Yes, yes, right. Okay, okay. Because I was good. My, my concern was okay. Got it. Is that enough? Is that are we looking at the right numbers? And I appreciate the recommendation from the transportation committee. But my just question is: Is that enough? Is that is that enough to kind of pull that off? You know, with this whole makeup, or or well, and I know it's just an estimate. That you don't you don't ever know until you kind of get into the project, though. So. Uh, understood. Based based on what it costs to do, for example, lights up, up along Riverside, right? There's a, a couple hundred thousand. Uh, that actually was a pretty good deal. Okay. Uh, I, I would not have expected us to be able to do that much lighting for that for that price. <coughs> so. Uh, you could envision three or four other locations <coughs> where you would do something similar. Uh, it, is it enough to do all that we would want to do throughout the county? Absolutely not. But there is no, right. currently no allocation for any specific project. Right. Uh, and this would uh, essentially earmark uh, that funding to be utilized okay. for projects right. like that. I mean, it's fine. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure that the committee kind of looked at it because these numbers have jumped the way they jumped. And this has been a, a, a long process and even getting to where we are now. So, yeah, I mean, I was just concerned with, you know, when we started moving dirt, are we really being realistic? Are we just trying to, you know, truly uh, get some real numbers? Are these realistic numbers that we're talking about? Well, you're referring to the project overall, the Lee Road widening, or for the lighting? The lighting. The yeah, lighting. We've already discussed them. We can, yeah. Certainly with a million dollars, we can target several locations for lighting or guardrail okay. or a component of a traffic signal uh, would be required. Yeah, okay. All right. I, I yield back. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Just one question. Yeah. Okay. And I have Commissioner Carpenter. Okay. Yes. okay. I do have one. Question. Uh, all of the right of way already purchased for the widening. Of the Lee Road? Yes. Yes. All the way to Fairburn Road. All the way to Fairburn Road. Okay. I get that. Okay. Commissioner Carthen. So Miguel, am I understanding that it's eleven million plus one million, so I'm voting on twelve million dollars. One million dollars coming from the uh Anna Wakey Road Highway ninety two project plus the eleven million. Correct. And the total <coughs> project is twenty one million dollars. That is correct. Now, 21 million, the other 10 is anticipated to be federal funding. Right. So 11 million of the 12 would go towards Lee Road. Mm -hmm. The other million would remain uh, to be distributed among safety projects, different locations, 
different uh, types of projects. Okay, so when you say that the um, developers are developing in that area, they're putting up lights and sidewalks, and then we're coming in and putting up what what they're missing. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Not a, not exactly. Um, what happens when a, a project comes in, whatever road frontage they have <coughs> on a road, then we uh, anticipate that or essentially require them to remedy uh, or mitigate the impact at their cost. <coughs> that corridor was up to recently partially a dirt road, Douglas Hill, uh, a good segment of it was just a dirt road, not even two lanes wide, more like a lane and a half. And uh, Factory Shoals was two lanes, narrow two lanes, perhaps 21 feet or so. That corridor, as part of the Sweetwater, uh, South Sweetwater Master Plan that was adopted several years ago, uh, was to go to three lane configuration to allow for left turn lanes into the various developments that came in there. Well, it just so happens that there, there was uh, such a demand for that type of facility that um, as soon as the ability was there that the county adopted the plan and allowed for that type of development, there were several uh, developments of uh, regional impact, which are the much larger projects uh, that came in uh, along that corridor. Since that time, there have been three others. So there's a total of six projects that have gone in within that corridor. So each one of those has been tasked with improving their frontage. However, they're not contiguous. And so there are gaps in between. And because they don't have any frontage on that road or because they they might be able to bring folks in from a different route. <coughs> the county would have to go in and fill in those gaps, so so as to make a continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, okay. Thank you so much. Um, I believe we're finished. Thank yep. you so much. We'll move on to the next item. Yep. Uh, I'm going to circle back, and I have Judge uh, Barker, who has just arrived. He arrived. A few minutes ago, Judge Parker, you're next. Tabin four, authorization to approve a contract with Judicial Alternatives of Georgia Incorporation JAG for misdemeanor uh, probation services for state court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final review. Judge Parker, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Judge. Um, <clears throat> this is our uh, contract with uh, JAG probation uh, that we renew on an annual basis. They are a private probation provider uh, for the state court. Uh, they also, as part of the contract, provide us with a probation officer that is designated to supervise our participants in the uh, accountability court program, the DUI drug court that we have, mm -hmm. and that's an included provision. Uh, this contract is uh, just a continuation of the one we had from last year. I'm not aware of any major changes that were made to it at all. They're still charging the same rate uh, that they charge for each probationer that hasn't changed as, as well. So, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Okay. Any questions? And, and Madam Chair, after they, uh, I appreciate Judge Bark for bringing this. This contract was pretty vetted hard uh, a couple years ago after some case decisions about improper handling of fines and 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 whatnot around the state of Georgia when they did criminal justice reform. So. The statute's been updated. I feel like it's it's a good contract based on it, and it comes to y'all. Uh, the new law is the judge has to bless it, so y'all can bless it. So he's blessed it. I've looked at it. I think other than sticking the term in, which Jennifer can do, which I think we'll run this. We run it 12 months, uh, Judge. We're going to run it at the end of the year. So 12 months. 12 months. 12 months. So it'll be 12 months from the time either party can get out of it uh, with 30 days, and the judge can order it gotten out of immediately for calls as I read the contract. But I wanted y'all to know with criminal justice reform, the enactments are embedded in, embedded into this contract. So they've got to comply with all that. Okay. A lot of it is from the state. They mandate the provisions in the contract. Okay. We have one question. I'll show you a question. Yeah, real quick, Judge, and this is, you know, I was involved in those conversations with the, the, the prior um, provider. So legally, let's say it's blessed. 
operationally are we comfortable in the services that are being provided out there, whether it's statewide or just whatever we're doing? Because that was really the question. It wasn't that it was legal. The issue is because remember, we were subsidizing, the county commission was subsidizing the prior provider. It was always this, this public debate whether or not should we be subsidizing this. Now, don't get it wrong. This is, you know, you, we have to provide for the courts. That's not my point. But should I be? Um, should we be subsidizing this private sector company? All right. So my question is: Is that are, is this a fully loaded contract? And I'm just putting it out here for public disclosure, or are we subsidizing? In other words, is there enough fees and stuff to come in here? Are we? we talk to me about that. Clarify. We haven't done that for two years. We have, that was with the prior provider. Um, that that had serviced the county for a yep. number of years because of the um, economic situation uh, and the numbers. That was a decision that was made uh, by the chief judge at that time a number of years ago. Yep. But uh, my understanding is we have not, I know there isn't any subsidizing with this contract. It wasn't last year. We haven't done any of that for at least two years. Is that <coughs> your understanding, Mark? Yes, sir. That's correct. And there's no need for it. This is a private company. They're they're doing a very good job for us, as far as I'm concerned, and that's why I'm recommending that we continue the relationship. Very good. And that was fine. We just for the record, the last part is <coughs> indigent. Let's bring back indigent. Uh, one of the state laws a couple of years ago, if I recall, and please correct me, is that we had to account for the indigent. In other words, somebody declared that they were indigent, whatever the case may be, we had to pick up those costs. So the forecast from, from perhaps um, fines or fees that were coming in to pay for this, uh, when that state law was passed down to us at the local level, we had to pick up that. Have that, have we, I mean, how has that impacted? And you may not have to answer that. Maybe, Jennifer, can y'all talk to us about the commission? Well, all I can tell you is, from our standpoint as judges, we have the authority in any sentencing to waive probation fees. Yes. We have that authority. Yes. Uh, and we are asked to do that from time to time. Not very often, but generally it's, you know, sometimes if they're represented by the public defender's office <coughs> and they're unemployed and that would be a financial burden on them and they make a showing to us, then, then we do that. We, we waive that. But that is not, that's nothing that we have to deal with. That's the, a risk. and that the private probation company takes that <coughs> risk on. They still supervise them, and they're required to do that even though they're not getting paid any probation supervision fees by that particular individual. But they obviously uh, believe they're being profitable even when we do make those orders. And we, we don't, of course, just pick people out to do it. It has to be brought to our attention at the time of the sentencing when we're imposing a sentence if they ask. and. Like I said, we are asked occasionally, and generally we grant those when those are uh, requested of us. It's not a challenge. It was just more of a to acknowledge the fact that yes. we, we have to pick up the burden. So no problem. Thank you, Judge. I'm sure I yield. Well, we don't pick up the burden. The private probation company yeah. is, is yeah, bearing that yeah, burden. But when it comes, and that was my whole point, but yes. when that hit, we as a commission sat there and picked up when, when the private probation, whatever the influence they had, it was brought for the commission to pick up like a private sector's deficit. I'm just bringing home this fact that there was a precedent that was set in, in the administration of times past. We were picking up whenever these state laws were happening, it was impacting whatever we, we just sort of keep the system going. And again, our, it's not the judge's fault. That we, we know that. I'm just breaking, you know what I'm talking about. And it was just for the record, Madam Chair, this is a different time, different era, and all I wanted, I'm looking for assurances that that was then. We acknowledge what was happening then, this is now, and we're feeling confident, move forward, that we don't have those type of exposures. Today. And that's what Mr. Bernard was referring to, the criminal justice reform, ensuring those types of provisions uh, are more necessary. Thank you. I'm good. And, and Madam Chair, just for the public knowledge, and uh, I'll defer to the judge on this, but the real problem wasn't just in sentencing. The real problem was when someone didn't have money to pay for probation, they'd go get put back in jail for a crime that nobody else would ever go to jail for. Mm -hmm. And so what we've eliminated is the, there's a process now to not hold people hostage that are indigent to the jail only. And so this is a, should be incorporated by statute into this uh, into, into this thing. So there's no longer a, a payment to get out right. if you actually qualify. And that's, a, that's in the discretion of the judge. But it's, uh, there's a very sincere effort statewide to stop these practices, which in some locales were money makers. Right. It's that we want to be a money maker. We just want to administer justice and, and move on and 
and this is incorporated and embedded in the criminal justice reform. Commissioner Mitchell was first. Commissioner, and, and, and just a couple questions. And, and, and I'm assuming, as you stated earlier, that whole indigency piece comes as a case by case, and you guys take it, you know, I mean, there's no rhyme or reason. It's dollars and cents, or <coughs> not, so on and so forth, and determining that fact. Those are inquiries we usually deal with at a plea. Got it, and then, you, then that's when you determine whether or not which direction we go as a <coughs> or not. Yes, sir. Okay, and the other one, the whole annual trying to make sure that they're on that annual basis of the contract, and it's probably more for Terenio. So I noticed you talked about now we are a month off. So is it is it based on the 12 months of this date, or we taking it from January moving forward? So everybody can be on the same contract, but I said, I think you said the state requires that you bless it first, and then come down to us, and by that time, you could be a month or two off. So how do we make sure that we stay on the same Cycle, Judge. Would there be any would there be any uh, problem with making this run through December thirty first of this year, so we can get line up the contract? What we're trying to do is not have so many contracts that expire at different times. It's left blank in here, so it's really right. you know whatever. I don't believe, Mister. I don't have a problem with it, and I doubt Mister. Donovan would as well. Yeah, and I think it, I think it just rolls over unless something happens. But we're going to want you to bring it back, obviously, like you know, the Jag requires. But right. we'd like to put December thirty first if that's possible, just so it lines up with everything else. I think that'd be fun. Right. Yeah, so, so, so Jennifer, will plug that in. Right. It's blank in here. Well, okay. We left it blank for that reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it just makes it easier for us because uh, I mean trying to look at these off dates when I think we all dig in, I think we dig in for that annual makeup versus, okay, there's two of them that's, you know, somewhere January, February, so on and so forth. So I think it makes it easier for the, the commission. Uh, outside of that, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. okay. I yield back. Commissioner Geiger. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Judge, um, the solicitor, when he, uh, uh, the previous solicitor, set up a partial payment uh, mechanism for people that were struggling, you know. Uh, do y'all have such a thing uh, where you can accept partial payments or set up a payment plan for for, <coughs> for, for actual people that go on probation? Well, the pop the PPOP is for it's only for traffic, and it's, <coughs> that was the whole idea of it was to keep people off probation. Oh, okay. <coughs> so this. <coughs> You're dealing with the JAG probation. They have nothing to do with PPOP. That's run through the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I yield back. Okay. So All right. right. Well, thank you so much. All right, Barb. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. All right. We'll move on to tab number seven. <coughs> tab number seven is authorization to adopt the Lee Road Small Area Plan and Corridor Study and approve staff to submit for commun community development assistance program. Funding. Uh, Manager Ron Roberts, good morning. Good morning, Thank Commissioner. You. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. How y'all doing today? Good morning. Well, let's go back to Lee Road. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I just, uh, for Commissioner Carthen's edification, I just take two seconds and catch up on where we are <coughs> with this. So about two years ago, Chris Pumphrey started a roundtable group. It was uh, some staff from the city, uh, 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 Mr. Shearhouse from the WSA. Uh, Jonathan Lynn uh, and, and the former, uh, the previous uh, DC DOT director Randy, and they started looking at different different areas of the county that they wanted to to, to study more and to invest in. So what they did was they came up with two areas: Sweetwater Master Plan, second was Lee Road. The Development Authority funded the, the study for the Sweetwater Master Plan, which Chris had mentioned earlier, and, and Miguel had been adopted. The Lee Road study was a was a small area study at the intersection of 92. And, uh, uh, and, and Lee Road. Um, and that was funded uh, through a BIR from my predecessor. And this past year, as we moved into it a little bit more, we recognized the fact that we needed to expand the scope of that with uh, the existing vendor, which was Clark Patterson Lee, and Rebecca Kiefer's here. She's gonna walk through a very quick presentation of what we've got. Um, but uh, th so the expansion was, uh, we used uh, SPLOSCI to expand the scope of that study. And that's where we are today. Um, our ask today is to is for an approved plan, and uh, we want to staff wants to pursue CDAP funding. Let me take a second. Community Development Assistance Program. You heard it, mm -hmm. LCI, mm -hmm. Livable Centers Initiative. Mm -hmm. That is going to be 
under the new vision that ARC has, those buckets of LCI funds will stay predominantly where heavy transit, TOD, transit-oriented developments are. So the, the, the mechanism that's being made available to the more rural counties like ours is going to be the CDAP funding. So the things that we, still, we, we normally would apply for, for LCI, sidewalks, pedestrian crossings, trails, those kind of things, we would be doing under CDAP. And that process actually has started. I've opened that. There's a, a workshop on Wednesday uh, to, to, for us to go and, and, and learn how to, to apply for that. So that gets into the background. Now, I'm going to bring Rebecca up, and we're going to walk through the, the Lee Road uh, corridor story. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Uh, as Ron mentioned, this will just be a brief presentation, and I apologize. I'm a little under the weather. So, um, all right. So the Lee Road... Uh, Small area and corridor. Um, I think I was here in December and went over a brief overview. So this is for uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the process um, and just a little bit of background. We had some substantial public engagement as a part of this process. Um, not only did we meet with the development round table. Uh, on a regular basis, but we also kicked off the um, the planning process at the September Saturdays event in 2017, and then um, returned again in 2018 um, to present the the master planning efforts that had gone on over the past year. A couple of open houses, comp plan, um, district two open house, as well as stakeholder interviews, uh, surveys, and things of that nature. So um, this plan is really uh, bounded on. Um, uh, has foundations in the public involvement throughout the entire process. Um, so through that public input process, we kind of developed this uh, plan purpose, what we were moving toward, and that's also helped organize the plan um, structure itself. So we had um, reflect, so that's kind of the, the looking back to all the other studies and plans that have been done um, and really synth synthesizing um, those comments and uh, almost testing them in a way, making sure that those were, were still true. And there were a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of repeat sentiments from those previous lands, um, engaging the public with that substantial public engagement. Um, and that's how we described in the plan um, what the public engagement plan entailed. And then anticipate. At, um, a big part of this project is to anticipate the development that uh, will come uh, the develop, development pressures that will come as a result of uh, completing the Lee Road Extension Project. And so these are the actual master plans themselves. And then prioritize how do we um, develop an implementation plan uh, to ensure that this happens, and kind of a step-by-step -step process. Uh, again, our findings were um, some of the primary needs were uh, special events, um, places for socializing, family-oriented activities, uh, maybe some public green space, uh, lots of pathway uh, requests for pathways, um, improving walkability and sustainability, um, and really installing a sense of community, a, a place where people could think of a, as downtown Douglas County. So we went through a series of concept developments, um, got some feedback. Uh, these are some of the concepts that were developed as a part of that process. And came on um, the small area plan. And this is kind of an aerial uh, above view uh, with the newly road extension being right here. Uh, this is where the um, racetrack is now, the tractor supply. So you would um, continue into the development to a roundabout, and that's how you would access it. It would be kind of limited access along the Lee Road extension um, for the purposes of making sure that that's a, a really strong east-west connector. Um, and then all the development is <coughs> here. One of the, the key pieces of, of that, so just to give you an idea, this is looking this way on the thing. Um, this is kind of a signature piece. The uh, stormwater detention is uh, part of the attraction. Uh, it's, it's a a body of water where also the stormwater is collected. People can interact with the water, um, have kayak, you know, get on kayaks, paddle boats, and things. There are also a series of bridges for people to be able to interact with um, with it. And it's a it's a mixed use development from um, that supports you know senior housing to uh, retail and kind of incubator spaces um, toward the back. 
uh, an eye level view. Here you see the, the ability to interact with the water and the kayaks. Uh, lots of people, lots of activity, uh, restaurants and things along the street. Parking in the center, so lots of on street parking. And there's uh, an example of one of those bridges that's envisioned. And then, of course, here's the plant, the land use plan for uh, Lee Road at the intersection that Chris had mentioned, uh, Fairburn Road and Lee Road, where it terminates today, um, connecting all the way over to Beaumar here. And so this is um, a key for all the land uses that are uh, identified in there. Next, we've got the corridor land use plan with making that connection, that Lee Road connection through here. Um, there would be uh, and doing the widening, um, we wanted to be able to identify what the land use <coughs> would want to be and what the community would want out of that new corridor that would be established. And what we heard was that we um, character areas were more favored. The, these key intersections along the corridor that were the commercial character areas of, of different intensity based on where it is on the, along the corridor, a little bit more intense um, to the north and a little bit more residential to the south. Um, and then residential along the way. The desire is not to have this be one long uh, commercial corridor. Um, so these are the land uses that we identified that would be appropriate. Um, townhouses had, uh, along the corridor as a, a little bit more intense, um, different kind of, of housing type um, along there. Some, some protection of some of the natural lands. This being the mixed use uh, small area study property and then again some more intense mixed use um, maybe some multifamily and uh, again townhomes and then the commercial that, that exists there today and uh, moving on to the implementation plan um, what you'll see in the plan is a, kind of a typ typical ac action plan um, that identifies costs and year <coughs> and from the public engagement plan we prioritize four of the sentiments from the public safety and access management, walkability, sustainability, uh, and then uh, zoning as an, implementa an important implementation tool for all of that. Uh, so access management, this is just an example of one of those. Um, <coughs> that for the existing curb cuts there along the way, um, a recommendation to do um, uh, through um, a corridor plan, you do environmental screening and an access management plan. Um, to, to look at as the properties are redeveloped, how to um, you know thin down those curb cuts, maybe uh, reduce them, and then also um, an ordinance, a proposed ordinance to uh, require a maximum number of curb cuts in succession. Uh, for the walkability component, um, some priority projects before you get to do that feasibility study. Um, some priority projects to <coughs> potentially install some pedestrian improvements uh, along the corridor. And some policies that you can uh, implement to um, kind of further some of your sustainability goals. And these would also um, help you toward your ARC Green Community Certification, elevating that, um, being able to do, um, you know, it, I think you already have a complete streets policy, but some of the green building policies and things that you might um, make use of in the actual small area plan development. And then zoning. Along that corridor, there, there was a good bit that um, being able to preserve and protect the residential that, that would need to stay the same, but then also some recommendations for how you could um, rezone some of those properties if you should choose. And then um, also in the appendix, uh, accompanying that would be some proposed uh, text for uh, amending the UDC. So our next steps um, would be adoption of this plan. As Ron had mentioned, we were working on um, you know, assembling the CDAP application to help get that next uh, level of study funds for the feasibility of the, of the full <coughs> corridor. Um, and then, so, you know, a kind of a more immediate change that you could do would be some of the regulatory changes, take a look at some of the uh, recommended text amendments in the appendix, and make those changes. Okay. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, for the commissioners, any questions? I think I saw your hand first, uh, Commissioner Guider. Thank you. Um, 
We are making big plans for other people's property. <laughs> um, so uh, the people that own this property, as far as rezoning, if they're not requesting rezoning, how can we re rezone it without their permission? It, it kind of all depends on how aggressive you want to be with the plans. It's something that you can um, sit back and uh, wait for a property owner to, to come to you to request the rezoning. If you would like to make sure that the plan uh, moves forward accordingly and something, if it's zoned for something now <coughs> that is kind of contrary to the plan, um, then uh, you have the ability to go through and um, rezone the property as um, the entity. There's just a Who process. Has there's the just ability a, to do that? Douglas I've County. never done that. There's just a process that you would have to go through of notifying property owners, publishing it, and, and things. So if a property owner did not want uh, say a commercial, their property to go commercial. Uh, we have the power to. Oh, I've just never done this as long as I've been on this board uh, because we're planning the future of their property that they're invested in. But will and what kind of notification will they have? Anything like this. this is a these are the, uh, the plan is a broad stroke. It's kind of identifying what we'd like to see. <laughs> okay. But I mean, and, and to your point, we, you know, we don't have to do go in and rezone anybody. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is like kind of laying out like what the perception would be and how things could could, could progress. And it's a guide, it's a path, it's a guide as these properties come online and, and, and opportunities present themselves that, that we want to take advantage of. We'll say, okay, well this is what we've identified in the study. Let's go ahead and, and look at these particular parcels of potential rezoning. I do want to add also the components of the Lee Road study was were, were put in the comprehensive plan, which we just adopted. Now the comprehensive plan sets up the future land use maps of what we want want to have anyways. And that's kind of like the direction that we want to go. And so this is kind of like part and parcel. They work with together with each other, this Sweetwater and uh, they all go into the comprehensive plan. And so that's kind of like the well, just vision of direction that we want to go. I didn't know if you were saying the development authority has the power <coughs> or the county commissioners have the power. It's, it's the county that does. It's not something that you have to do. You, you can sit back and wait for the property owners to, to come and make requests. So each property owner will have a say-so in what we do with their property. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, there is a, a public process, a public hearing process, okay. regardless of who initiates the rezoning. And are they notified? Because some people may not live here, but they own property mm -hmm. here. Uh, but you uh, give them plenty of notice. And yes, ma'am, there'd be a holistic mailing and, and uh, on the website. We've been doing this all along for the, for the Lee Road study. We've been collecting things. It's on, the, it's on our website. We've got the face, Facebook page, all that. And this would be part, this would be part of that effort as well, moving forward. And for a rezoning, uh, I think state law requires uh, everyone be notified within 250 feet of the subject property, including the property owner, um, if, if they're not yes. the ones initiating it. I don't know if your code so, is more stringent. So the plan uh, is what we would like to see, <coughs> but it's not rigid. It's, it's what? It's not rigid. It's, it, it's, right, right, right. It's it, not set and go. You would refer to the plans if a rezoning came before you and you had an adopted plan. You could refer to the plans and say, you know, this, this rezoning request does not meet some of our adopted master plans and comp plans um, for X, Y, Z reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is why we would support something different other than, than what's coming before us. And th this includes from uh, Interstate 20 all the way over to Beaumar Road. There's two legs of it. Mm -hmm. this all the way to Chapel Hill. Yeah, where Beaumar intersects with Chapel Hill. Okay, and how far in the future are we talking about this? <laughs> uh, 10, 20 years. For, for full implementation, yes. Um, and is it going to start in the first leg from uh, I-20 to Fairman Road first, or the whole thing is going to be happening? I think it's going to develop organically at the opportunity to present themselves. And, the yeah. and one thing you've got going for you right now is in the 20 to Fairburn Road right now is you've got the Lee Wood Road widening. And so there's going to be some development pressure there. Um, and it looks like Chris also has uh, a strategy, probably, and, that he wants And the widening, the right of has already been purchased from the home. That's, that's, right. that's what property. Miguel said this morning, all the way through to 92. Okay. If I could just add to your questions about the timing. Um, <coughs> when the plan is adopted, the plan is adopted. So there's no 
uh, timetable to say, all right, we're going to take this property and rezone that and redevelop that. It's just basically setting the whole corridor in place so that over time, as I forgot who, who mentioned it first, when a property owner or developer comes forward for a rezoning or to develop a piece of property, we're taking the entire corridor into consideration, but it's not necessarily laying out to say the county is going to come through and start implementing all these developments along the, uh, the corridor. But the, the, the public was sort of representative uh, in the community development assistant uh, or in the uh, committees that were set up. I know I had to appoint one or two people <coughs> that it was... Um, are you talking about that, the outreach? They, they were looking yeah. out for uh, <coughs> District 4. So <laughs> you had people in these districts, I think it's two and three, that may be affected by this, right? Uh, yeah, I, we're not sure really who was representing which district as far as who we talked to, but um, it was pretty broad outreach. And um, we did reach out to all the recommendations. I think there were uh, a number of people who we maybe didn't get to talk to um, through the stakeholder <coughs> interviews, but um, we reached out to several times. So, so the, so the property talked. owners, mm -hmm. as of today, have not been notified about the far off plans yet. The property owners, no, no, have not been given mailers or anything because there's no zoning change that's been proposed. I know it, but wouldn't it have been nice to have notified them of our plans for their property? <laughs> and that's, I mean, part, that's part of the broad why not? outreach. If it's going to, uh, you know, affect people's property, why would we not give them heads up notice, notification? And on a master planning level, uh, the kind of outreach that, that you do, because it is still visionary at that point, is more of the broad outreach. Hey, we've got this plan, and it, it entails this, this section. Because you're not changing the zoning of individual properties, <coughs> um, it's not an indi individual ma mailer that is done at, at that stage of the process. I yield back. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I think, again, <coughs> You know, I, I do appreciate um, the work that you guys have done. Um, the, the county was never progressive enough to, to think long term when I came online in, in 2010. And history is always important, right? When I looked at the, the Thornton Roar corridor, I was like, too much light industrial, too much blue, too much truck traffic. But that's what we knew. That's where we were as a county, right? Why no Class A property? Why? It, it, it just sort of worked on its own. And one of the things that we have as legislators at the local level is that we, we can set the future. And that's what we set out to do here. So when I saw we had um, new leadership, younger leadership that came on board and sort of could think <coughs> to the future, embrace some of the strategic planning processes that were out there, um, leverage some of the best practices that were going on through the state, I, you know, I, I thought like, okay, now we're going. Uh, back in 2013, when we had to declare, you know, slum and blight, right, just to get funding, right, and we had to clean up and everyone in the comments was, well, they need to redevelop District 2. And I was like, <coughs> be right back. Um, and it's one of those where, you know, um, in, in this area, two things. You do want to redevelop, but we also want to anticipate the future. Um, in the Thornton Road Corridor, a lot of those property owners were involved in that um, master planning process. Now, if people, um, to that point, I think people had the right as property owners to be involved in the process to see where your neighbors want to go, right? One of the things you hear a lot of times in my district is that, you know what, <coughs> citizens are telling you, if you're paying attention, that we don't want that on our street. We, we prefer this, we prefer that. So they're all at the table. You can choose to vote, you can choose not to vote, right? We've always been, if you notice, I'm always active out there saying, okay, what do y'all want? Let me go advocate for you. That's important here. So this is not like it was removed. I want to make sure I give cover. Like, no, you don't have to defend. Citizens had a right to get involved in this, to participate in this. Property owners, non-property owners, removing the passive, <coughs> et cetera. Right? This has been a public process for the past two years that we've walked, thought through this. Like, what do we want the future to be? How do we want our county to play out versus it just sort of happening on its own because again leadership didn't take an active role of trying to marshal resources marshal expectations right right so there's different ways to approach things just sort of just sit, sitting there 
Let's get everybody at the table, anticipate the future, 10 to 20 years, right? And so I, I, um, I think I, I appreciate the work that's being done. Um, I, I think we, to your point, Chris Pumphrey, I think we, we, we probably could have done this, this subject backwards, but I think sometimes money is always better to just deal with it front, up front. But there is a role that we have to play by way of infrastructure, right? Which is a whole role, the role of widening and expansion, right? In other words, we do have a role in this, right? We gotta cut a road. That's real money. We gotta widen the road. That's real money. So if the public is telling us that that's where they want to go, regardless, there is an infrastructure component to this, right? A vision without funding is just a dream, right? And so what this shows is that we're somewhat committed to at least to a certain phase, a certain point, and the next administration will take over from us, right? At some point is that we're only going to be able to carry it so far. The next group will carry it. The next group will carry it. But I, I think I, I, I'm encouraged by what I saw. Um, as it relates to um, you guys' efforts and so forth. Ron Roberts, thank you for coming on board and, and carrying it forward. I mean, all these guys are doing a great job <coughs> sort of doing something that we never did in the past. And I, 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 you, you hear a transition because we didn't do it that way back then, right? And I, I appreciate that we now can embrace the future and move us forward, uh, but be transparent and be open about it. So I just want to, again, appreciate the process that you're having to go through. We're not locking anybody in, but it doesn't prohibit First Amendment right to cast forward what we want the future to be. So I appreciate it and I give back. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, just to make one thing, uh, and I was confirming with Chris, you have to look at this if you decide to go forward with a public hearing to adopt the future land use revision, one, the public would also be involved in that process. But it simply is a tool, is an overlay, so that when people come up for individual zonings, you got something, you got a, you got a basis right. for yay or nay. If you say nay, there's also a, a process that the uh, individual landowner can challenge right. your nay for a lot of other reasons. So there's a couple other steps involved in this, but much like the three acre minimum that got proposed in, in what, for the Dog River Basin, mm -hmm. it, it becomes a safety net tool for which to judge permitting and other things and zonings. But there's still other rights that accrue to the individual landowner. You can't just take the property no. right. uh, without paying for it anyway. So I just want y'all to know it simply would be a tool if you choose to go forward. The reason why whatever they've done, they've done, they're, they're in the planning mode of just giving you options. It's not progressed to say, are we taking it forward to the public? This is what we want to do and have a, an adoption hearing and all that or, or not, as I understand it. So. But if it's adopted, it still won't kick somebody out of their house or their farm or their whatever. It, when that property goes on the market for sale or gets transitioned to somebody, if they go for zoning, it is what you look at that map as a basis for staff to make criteria judgments on whether to approve, to recommend approval of the zoning request or not. So you can get consistency in that corridor is really what it is, a tool. Okay. Thank you so much, Bernard. Um, we have another comment. Um, yeah, so just to director. kind of lay the, the groundwork, so as, as, Mark, as I'm sorry, Ron mentioned, we did have a, a committee that looked at various corridors. So the first one was the Thornton Road corridor, and out of that came the Sweetwater Master Plan. Um, and so the second corridor is this Fairburn Road, and you know, 92 as a whole is being invested in, whether it's, you know, all the way up in the northern part of Atlanta, <coughs> coming all the way down. We had our segment that was widened to four lanes. Um, but as we kind of walked walk through it and we looked at, you know, the impact of that this small area study, knowing that we had this right-of-way acquisition that had already taken place along Lee Road, and without, and, and if Lee Road moves forward <coughs> on the widening, you also need to have an understanding of what what happens to the the leftover land that's that's you know that's impacted by that you know when the the right of way acquisition takes place you know you start changing you, you've already started to change what the parcels look like along that corridor development's going to start taking place so you need to study and understand what is the future land use um, of that corridor so that's kind of how this part got got going thus pushing back up the need to widen um, Lee Road to the point about you know rezonings and things like that. Um, as of December, we now, um, as the development authority, have 136 acres under option um, at the intersection of Lee Road and 92. So pretty much everything that is around that Walgreens, the core part of this um, small area study, we have that component under under option. 
for a two-year time frame for us to do our due diligence, take this this uh, small area plan, and look towards how we, how we implement implement that plan, and then also taking it to market. So we will start marketing that property now. We're, but all the pieces are are coming together. Hopefully, with the adoption of the the, the matching funds for the widening, the land use plan, what the what the vision is going to be and then starting to cater towards our target sectors of uh, professional services and technology companies. So that's what this, all of these pieces are coming to play to Mich Commissioner Robinson's point. It's being forward thinking, very thoughtful in what we do and making sure that it all lines up and not just picking you know, different pieces off, but everything is flowing together. Okay, thank you so much. And just add one more thing too, as we come online, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that are in our, in our UDC, our Unified Development Code that don't really address some of the visions that we have here, mm -hmm. and that's what staff is going to have to be really engaged in, in making some changes and tweaks to that, okay. so that the development we want to see can occur. Yeah. <coughs> Very good presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you all. So much. We'll move on to the next tab, which is tab number eight. Tab number eight, authorization to renew an agreement with Credit Bureau System Incorporation DBA and Ambulance um, Medical Building for Emergency Medical Services Building and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Uh, Chief Spencer. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is our, uh, for our EMS billing. Uh, this is our third party agent we use to do all of our emergency medical services billing. Uh, and then the next item is for the collections uh, for, the, for the same contract. So. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? I don't have a quorum. Oh. Everybody got a good point. Yeah, the rest of the I'll say it. Okay. Any questions for the Chief? I'm quite sure Don left this time. No, we're good. <laughs> okay, we're moving to tab cam number nine. Oh, let's see, this is a good time for you, Chief. Your authorization to renew an agreement with Southern uh, Credit Bureau and DBA Creditors Bureau Associ yeah. Association for collection on emergency medical services invoices and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents <coughs> pending final legal review. Chief, again. Chief uh, yes, ma'am. This is the uh, collection part of that. Uh, if somebody doesn't pay their bills <coughs> and after so many days it goes into collections, uh, and this is the company that takes care of that for the county. Okay. Any questions from the board? No, ma'am. Okay, do we need to take a two minute break? The board commissioners? Okay. I'll, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. Oh, y'all say. Okay, <laughs> number 10, an authorization to approve a car allowance agreement for the chief deputy solicitor and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Ma um, Madam Chair, I believe. Yeah, the, uh, the new solicitor general has chosen a deputy, and this is just a car replacement. And what I mean by that is it's replacing the former deputy's car allowance. Okay. So we have them all under contract and they do a car allowance to understand the rules of the county. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay, we'll move on to the next item, tab number 11, authorization to renew an agreement with the Business Watch International Incorporation, BWI, for three years and for a total cost of $3,500 annually and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Uh, Major Holmes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is the uh, one of two programs we have that monitors our pawn shop systems. And uh, this is just a renewal <coughs> for that. Okay, any questions from the board? Okay. We'll move on to tab number 12, authorization to accept reimbursement from Georgia Emergency Ma Management Agency, GEMA, for the payment of 2017 um, Homeland Security Grant in the amount of $64,098.92 and return to the general fund. Major Holmes, could you elaborate on this for us? Uh, yes, board? this is a, a grant that was awarded in October 2017. It's a reimbursement grant. Uh, the items that were purchased as related to this were for our tactical cert team. Uh, they were able to purchase in 2018, 18 helmets for them, 18 pelters, and that's uh, part of the communication devices that they use, and two ballistic shields. Um, so this money is <coughs> in place that was forwarded to, uh, to purchase those items. Okay. Any questions from the board? 
Okay. I'll move on to the next item, tab number 13, authorization to approve a contract clear for five years for a total cost of $34,346.67 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Major Holmes again. Uh, clear is replacing our previous um, intelligence gathering program that we have with Accurant. Uh, this is the new, what we're going to go with. Um, and the five-year contract, I believe, is something that's a little bit um, lengthy, but in the negotiation process for us to be able to get the price that we got, that's why mm -hmm. we went out that far. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions from the board, Commissioner Geiger? Uh, yes, Bobby. Um, I've seen clear advertised on TV, and it was like recognition of if your hand <coughs> or your iris or something. This is it, the same thing? I have no knowledge. It has been. So what is this for? This is our intelligence gathering. Accurate was the way we would do a lot of research, uh, a lot of databases and things like that, uh, searching information. Search engines and yes. things like that. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Any commission? Okay. Well, I'll move on to the next item. Thank you so much. Major Holmes. Uh, mm -hmm. Our next item is tab number 14, authorization mm -hmm. to award a contract to CBM of Atlanta Incorporation for janitorial services for the Douglas County Courthouse at an annual cost of $79,632 <coughs> and authorize the chairman to sign our related documents. Director Peacock. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman. Mm -hmm. We sent out a bid uh, in November of last year to um, see if we could uh, find the right janitorial services to maintain the courthouse for us. Uh, we, we got six proposals, I'm sorry, actually we got six bids back in based on that invitation to bid. Um, we interviewed four of those six um, and are from the purchasing oversight committee and we are recommending that CBM Atlanta be awarded the contract for 2019. Okay. Any questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? <coughs> we are on uh, right. Commissioner Robson. We just walked in. We, we were talking about this uh, award of the CBM Atlanta contract for the janitorial general, services. You have any questions regarding that one? You, um, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking okay. sadly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Mission of Guider. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, they were not the low bidder. They were not. Uh, they were the third low yes, bidder. Uh, is this normal procedure that we, is there any reason we eliminated the other two low bidders? Yes, ma'am. Uh, again, we interviewed all four of these, uh, and based on their um, cert certifications, uh, what uh, what they had been certified to do in certain medical arenas as well as in other industrial arenas, uh, they were they had not didn't have certifications, so we dropped them from the list, uh, and others <coughs> just didn't seem to have the the uh, ability to provide the county the best services they were looking for, and and the qualifier that we use is we choose the vendor that meets the best interest of the county and we didn't think that the two low bids met that bar so we're recommending that the, the third lowest bidder actually be given the contract. Were these certifications written in the specifications that was put out when we bid? Again a bid is not a, it's not a proposal it's oh, a bid okay. Okay. so really all that we asked for was a price but was it in the specifications that they have to be certified in certain fields? It would not have been in the bid, no ma'am. It, it, it came up after the, the bids were, were submitted and the uh, need for the uh, purchasing oversight committee to become involved. Uh, it really was an evaluation committee. I, I'm, it really well, wasn't the purchase team. It was not a, wasn't a committee. It's not the team, it was just an evaluation team that actually consisted of members of the Purchasing Oversight Committee. So we have the right to uh, not uh, award bids to low bidders. Mm -hmm. And that we're taking, taking that option here and not awarding it to either of the two low bidders. 
You mentioned uh, uh, some kind of medical certification. Why do they have to have a medical certification? Well, to it, clean it, medical it, it, it tells us that if they're certified to work in that type of arena, that they're, they're very well trained. They're, they're, they're very uh, up to date on all the standards. Uh, and um, it gives the, us an opportunity to use them in other parts of the county if we decide, desire to. Are you okay? Thank you so much, Commissioner Knight. Any other questions or concerns from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Parker. So, <coughs> in hindsight, and us doing it this way to piggyback off of what Commissioner Guyer said, if we're not going with the two lowest, we're saying we're going with the third one just because we can and it met our needs. Is that the best way to do it going forward, then? In hindsight, now that we 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 looked at it, we we did it this way because there were some questions before I got here regarding the lowest bidder, <coughs> since they were just so far apart from, from what the norm was. Well, the first decision that you would make is whether you wanted to do this as a bid or as a request for proposal. With the request for proposal, you get a lot more information about the vendor than just a price. So that's the first question you have to make: Is it uh, is the service are the services that we're looking for professional services that require a certain level of qualification and ability? <coughs> uh, and so you decide that first, and then um, uh, bids are normally for a product or service that are straightforward. You know, cutting the grass, you know, janitorial services, uh, but there are a, we we would need to decide again, going into a, a bid or a proposal, which of those we wanted to use. And then that would guide us as to how active we were in, in choosing a company other than just depending on price. So being as though we decided that we would look at all of the four bidders that came through and that the purchasing office opened up their bids for. And the discussion between the purchasers <coughs> before I got here, um, what why, why would we not then just put it back on the floor and say, okay, let's re redo this because it, it just wasn't done the right way? Because it, it was, it's, not, it's not that it wasn't done the right way. Okay. It's that there, there was a desire from a commissioner on the board mm -hmm. to, um, the, the process was developing, was in um, uh, developing the purchasing oversight committee was in play it hadn't been developed yet. The thought was, well, maybe we need to have that in play <coughs> before we start awarding contracts or bids. Um, and I, there, were, there are other things that I just don't can't voice right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in your opinion, would this be the best way to handle it <coughs> going forward? No. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> it would that's, not that's, be. That's, that's, that's it would not be. Do and contracts. legally, could we could we decide not to not to go with it? Commissioner? You could decide to reject any and all bids and put it back on the as we bid the process and maybe negotiate on an interim basis with whoever's providing the service. And I think you know I don't want to speak for Bill, so but uh, let me just say just from abroad, having not been in, in the criteria reference. So essentially, what you have <coughs> is you have three different types. You have request for proposal, request for bid, request for qualifications. Uh, we did a request for bid, it sounds like, where we're seeking price and our statute says that we got to go with the lowest responsible bidder. Well, what's the, que the question? And what Bill's referring to is what is that? You know, in a perfect world, if you're going to have qualifications, you sort of like them to be objective so that the committee has, here's the scale the score that we're going to qualify. And the only thing I can compare it to, just from an easier standpoint, would be, it had this been a DOT project, under state law, we would have had to take the lowest bidder once we opened their bid. But what you do is you qualify them in advance of opening their bid, and if they don't meet the qualifications, you don't open their bid because they're not qualified to bid. So then under state law, you could have got to the third, the third highest, I guess, I don't see it as the third highest if the first two were rejected because of qualifications. What it sounds like happened in this is you had a bid process 
and it superimposed on that process at some point was a qualification process. And it, 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 as Bill would probably indicate, it just doesn't look good. It's not a good look. Is it illegal? There are words in our bids that say you can pick just about anybody you want to. Does it sort of defeat the statute where it says you're supposed to pick the lowest responsible bidder? And then the responsible, the responsible criteria is in somebody's head on committee as opposed to here's what we're basing it on. Are you certified for medical? Have you handled multi-million dollar projects? Have you handled square footage? Do you have the right insurance? How many employees do you have? How many can you, if those criteria were developed initially, probably some of these people could have been eliminated and we would never open a bid and so we wouldn't be asking that question now. From a transparency <coughs> standpoint, Bill is absolutely correct that it's probably legal. From a look standpoint, it looks like it's been hijacked. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you might want to consider either just moving forward because we're in the middle of the year. <clears throat> the second option would be to go negotiate a few months with whoever and get this, reject all these and start over. Man, let me mention that the CBM is our current vendor today. Okay, so this is the current vendor, it sounds like. It is. Uh, I don't know that the outcome is going to be any different. I don't know, but my point is we've superimposed a, pro a process on a process that, you know, I can't say is, it, it is unlawful. I don't think there's bad motivations from what I've seen. I think the problem is you can't change the rules as you're playing the game. And we sort of, <coughs> this was maneuvered a little bit. Not to get a specific outcome, but to try to get better. We were trying to impose another best practices in the middle of a practice, mm -hmm. if, if that's what I mean by that, okay? Mm -hmm. that, Bill, is that fair, what I said? Yes, okay. yes absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the, the comments, and um, I'm gonna, this is BC before Carthen, so she can sit here and just sort of take the context. Um, and, and Commissioner Mitchell, I don't know if he's in the door or not, but I'm sure he'll, he'll hear me. Um, you know, we, we questioned this on day one when it came for a period. There was no maneuvering. The Board of Commissioners looked at this and said, something's not right. Period. We're probably in the same position. I looked at Commissioner Mitchell, I was like, okay, what did he say? And we looked at this and there was some question about, hmm, I don't think it was a superimposing, but our, our, as, as oversight, we want, okay, what are you guys doing? What are we, what are we doing here? Right, and I think that the, the, the desire, just the perfect timing was we're in transition anyway. We've got a, a new committee. No, we know that Madam Chair was anticipating setting. Uh, we didn't quite know who was gonna be the chair of those committees. We knew it was coming, let's put it that for all intents and purposes until she, she, she made her decision. But, but that being said, that, without belaboring it, um, um, you know, the county has evolved, guys. We don't, it's not what's like written. This is a rules-based county. You guys, you guys play the rules, nothing's written. You know, I got the, the state legislator's rule book. Every committee, everything. Rules, but those rules are written, right? Our policies are antiquated. They, they've aged, right? Now, a, a person's capacity to be able to navigate that matrix is, is, is on the individual, right? So every now and then, you guys are pitching fastballs, you know, via the chairman to pass things through this, right? get it through us. Every now and then, we'll wake up and say, okay, what, did, what was that? Most things we just sort of let go, we, we just sort of let go, but every now and then, we'll get involved in something. And it was, you know, I think what Commissioner Mitchell was looking at was something I saw totally, I was like, we're probably landing on the same point for different reasons, as you guys know we do. And it was one of those where, hold on, what now? And I came at it from more from a process, not a vendor. <coughs> I think he was looking at price variance, price discrepancy, I mean, bid discrepancy, and I looked at it like, hold on, what now? And I got into, I, I got into how we <laughs> define things, and I just, I, I think I concluded where in my, when I got involved, it's like, you know what? I'm just uncomfortable how we got here. All right, so my, I'm, I'm going to lean to the chairman of uh, purchasing now to sort of, but I would, I would, I just throw it all away and start over and, and, and let the new process come. So I don't think we're trying to superimpose. Uh, I just know that the, the new chairman won't have time enough. We're not, we don't have to take this now. 
We don't have to decide now. We can throw it away and give her time, three months, four months, six months, to come up with a better process. Uh, we don't have to accept that. You've got a vendor already in play. Let them finish this thing. But we shouldn't be here, but nevertheless, that's what we do. Our job is to challenge the administration, right? We're oversight. And I, I, I mean, I'm going to speak for me only. That I would throw it away. Throw away this bid uh, and give the new um, chair of purchase to come up with an opportunity to come up with a new process, uh, however long it takes her. I mean, if it took us this many years to get to this place of needing to change, we can at least give her a few months to get her mind around it. So for us, for at least for me and her, when we sat in that meeting, I mean, we she looked at it from her perspective and I looked at it from mine. There's two different perspectives. I had history. And I'm like, hmm, I, I, I didn't like the feel. Uh, and so um, my suggestion to my, my fellow colleagues, we just throw this thing away, period, and um, uh, let the administration, Mark and you and Bill and Ken go away and come back with an amendment to the existing co contract provider, whatever it is. I think we extended it for two months through the end of February. So we've got somebody who's cleaning the courthouse now, um, letting them, um, uh, if you need to adjust it, since they were clean, their contract was based on some footage, uh, whatever adjustment needs to be made until we can come out with another process. In other words, we're gonna clean this courthouse. We don't have to make a decision now based on something that we think is flawed. There wasn't no maneuvering. We, we <coughs> just, I mean, so I wanna be clear about maneuvering. We just think it was flawed. We didn't like the process. I want to clarify what my position was. Like, ah, uh, you know, every now and then, you know, we work, we do work together. And uh, where, you know, again, Commissioner Mitchell was pushing on one thing, and once I got into it, it's like, ooh, wait a minute, back up. So I'll be clear when I heard the comments y'all were saying. Let, let's let's add balance to the conversation. Um, I, I'd like to. I'm going to leave it at that. I, I'd like to throw it away. Give Commissioner Carthen time to to sort of set a new process. Uh, on this, and you guys, Madam Chair, you work out with the current um, provider, make sure the courthouse continues to be clean, and I'll support whatever you need to get done with that. I yield. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Guider. Yes. Uh, if uh, y'all are comfortable with this, I think we we have an old saying in Alabama: "You beat this horse to death." You know. Um, we're talking about a, you know a relatively small contract, but the main thing is perception. Sometimes the perception of uh, procedure can be more dangerous than uh, you know anything else. So we don't want to put uh, any kind of red flag out there for vendors that may be. Um, Wanting to bid to Douglas County and say, well, they pick, they pick and choose whoever they want to. So we don't want to do that. And so the perception here was a uh, problem. I wanted to know why they didn't go with the lower bid uh, if the person didn't uh, come through with what they, uh, you know, bid on. Then they could be removed, and we could uh, go on from there. But. Um, I don't think we should throw this out and start all over because now everybody's got figures out there and it could be perceived as we're trying to, you know, beat these figures here. So, because um, they bid on a um, monthly basis and they're all probably within uh, about Two thousand. Well, no, there's one that's way up there. But who would say that these same people wouldn't bid and come in at this price that we're already put out there? So uh, I don't think we should start over. But just remember that rules were set to to also uh, alleviate the perception of uh, misconduct. So I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Thank Commissioner Bell. Commissioner um, Mitchell Bell. Yeah. yeah, and I just want to chime in to say, um, you're right, this this was a just a question that was brought up and everybody kind of chimed in. And as we stated, uh, Madam Chair of the uh, Purchasing Committee needs to kind of decide on what that decision will be as to how we kind of move. But however, before I, before I finish that statement, Ken, you stated that in the event, what what would be the, the the legal right way that if we so choose, and I think we try to do this 
at a meeting or two ago. Just toss them all out, start over fresh, and kind of do that whole makeup. However, if by chance you're trying to carve out somebody within now, might be in question, correct? So kind of hit, give me that once more for the general public. You talking about the, 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 the process to eliminate people based on qualification? No, just what we did before where we were, mm -hmm. we were trying with the four vendors that we've got there, and I don't know who they are right off the top of my head, that we, we looked at trying to um, toss them all out a, a few meetings ago mm -hmm. when Mike was here. Toss them all out and start over fresh. Reject all bids. Yeah, reject yeah, all bids. Yeah, I'm sorry. All yeah, reject all bids. And, and do it that way versus trying to kind of gut out somebody now and, and, let, and not have the perception become um, not what we're trying to find and carve out and grab somebody that, that we're trying to grab and, and, and the perception may look bad, but you have made yeah, that. Well, well, if you did that, there would be a motion to reject any and all bids and to rebid this process because for purchasing, to go back out and bid, they gotta have board authority at this level, right? We're above right. 50. Right. So you would, uh, 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 you would, uh, the county would, or uh, there would be a motion to reject any and all bids and throw out this process essentially, and authorize the purchasing department through the county administrator, the purchasing to, committee, the purchasing committee, or whoever, right. Right. Mm -hmm. to uh, put together to rebid it, rebid it, and make that recommendation. Blah blah blah, and that whole process. And, and what tag would be this? Okay. Let me, if I can ask Bill a question, okay. Bill, we want a month to month with the current vendor. Or so it would just continue until we stop it. We don't need approvals to extend the current vendor anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it sounds like if you did that, you still have somebody to clean the courthouse in place. Mm -hmm. Correct. So we won't we won't miss the cleaning right. and we won't miss anything. We'll just keep who we've got and kind of move forward. Mm -hmm. and, and the going forward part, I would right. just I would just say, if if criteria and qualifications are going to be substantive, that what you do is you put that in the front. Well, I agree. Totally. And then pre-qual people to be able to bid, so you only open qualified bids, and then you're stuck arguably with the lowest responsive bidder. It would be harder to articulate that well, they're not responsible when you've just approved. Not quite bid. though. We, we we're not stuck with the lowest bid. You know, uh, just from the fact that it's the lowest bid. Yeah, well, if you qualify somebody in advance mm -hmm. to bid, then you've said they're a responsible bidder. Then you have to take under our ordinance the lowest bidder. Why would you not do that if you uh, pre-qualify? I'm just asking, only yeah. only because you don't want to get stuck with just because, as we saw in this case, and these guys might want to share on how much they want to share, that <coughs> there was a reasoning as to why um, these guys were that low. Well, there's, there's multiple ways to do this. I don't okay. want to say that, that Ken's only giving you the one way. I use the DOT comparison. Mm -hmm. But if you pre-qual bidders, mm -hmm. then you've eliminated their, they're not responsible, well, arguably under a statute. If you do it some other way, you'd have to have a criteria set out where okay. we're going to give price this much weight, we're going to give <laughs> insurance, history, you know. And, and that's what I'm alluding to. So yeah. now that, that we're making this, getting to this point of reference, that Madam Chair will actually look at that from that perspective. She'll have time to at least put that together because I would not say just go with the lowest bidder because, you know, cheap is not always better. Right. The cheapest is not always the best. You know, when you talk about quality and everything else. However, I just don't want us to get stuck in that frame of mindset to say, well, we qualified them and now we got the lowest bidder and that's what we got to go with. Sure. Well, if the qualifications were written right, they should be able to perform at the lowest And it should, be able to, it should be able to get eliminate a whole lot of stuff. Right. When you go to prior performance, when you go to references, when you go to interview process, when you go to certification, exactly. Exactly. when you go to insurance, mm -hmm. employees, dedicated employees on site, mm -hmm. You're eliminated people that probably aren't responsible that mm -hmm. you'd be worried about. And I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. I'm just saying if this oh, was a DOT project, that's exactly what we would do. And I'm glad we're having this conversation. And the reason this conversation is so that Madam Chair could actually look at the whole possibility of how she formulated what that process would entail. Right. So th that's the reasoning for this whole dialogue. So I think it's, you're absolutely on point. And, and I think she'll pick up on kind of what that direction is. I agree we probably should remove it. I think we should kind of eliminate it and deal with whom we've got for now until we can figure out what the future looks like in that particular uh, makeup versus <clears throat> trying to go with any of the bids up or down or how low or wherever they are. We just kind of stay where we are and move forward and give everybody time to process what this process will look like and what that really is. I just want to make sure that legally 
that we're not off to, you know. Well, we really hadn't harmed you by if you okay. were, if you have the option to reject all bids. Right. You're keeping the current vendor on a month to month. So they haven't been harmed, even though they would have gotten this award arguably if they got approved. Correct. And, you've, and, and you're coming up with a process that y'all think is using best practices, whatever it's going to be. Right. Um, and I'm glad to work with the chairman on whatever she wants from our side. There's exactly. multiple ways to bid proposals, obviously. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I just was using the DOT because it's kind of the cleanest oh, oh, reference point. Okay. Okay. If the board wants, desires to reject all bids, there's an item on the table. Yes, exactly. That. That, mm -hmm. Yes, because it's already on the it was put on, on the table. table. Yes. So you remove it from the, the table, table, reject all bids, reject and authorize and my motion. That's correct. The purchasing committee or, or whatever it's called. I'm right, sorry. Right. I, you're right. I know you're I heard right. it. Oversight. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, authorize them to to re uh, authorize purchasing to rebid subject to uh, the purchasing. Mm -hmm. purchasing. Purchasing, yeah, literally it is. Subject to the purchasing committee making a recommendation of some sort. Well, I'm not sure how that delegation is okay. occurring. Let me just make sure we're clear on okay. this. I think the the proposed committee oversees, uh, but does not run the purchasing department. That's correct. Because the purchasing department has got a statute oh, that says how <laughs> Bill's supposed to do his job Understood. and his team. Understood. So if, if from oversight, I guess they're used, depending upon how you come up with the formulation, how is the oversight committee used? Is it used to help the evaluation team? Those rule, those have to be sorted. But I don't want to say that the board right now can impose a committee over the ordinance because the ordinance clearly lays out how purchasing functions carried out. You'd have to amend your ordinance. Well, we could say that same thing about parks and rec, finance, and so on okay. and so forth. So, but but we won't go. That's that's a whole another conversation though. But that's what would be my recommendation. So I, I, I yield back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman. Yeah, I just want to clarify. Well, just to piggyback on that, I mean, nobody's exempt from oversight. No one. Nobody's above our capacity to be able to look at anything. All right. I think to the point, it was always asked: are, Is the commissioners are you going to look at everything? That wasn't the point. The point: We'll randomly sample stuff from time to time, and take a look at it. This just happened to. I mean, it, it, again, it wasn't intentional. It just every now and then we will look at something. I mean, we know how we've done here. History shows that. You know, is what Commissioner Mulder would say, staff shenanigans. You pass contracts through with no paperwork and try to work contracts, and we happen to catch it. Let's, let's be real clear about this. Our job is to randomly sample. We can't oversight. We can't micromanage. We don't have time. That's not what we're here for. We're here part-time. But every now and then, we have the right and the authority to be able to look at it like, no, I don't accept that. I don't agree. I just represent one voice. So y'all know where I'm coming from. I'm just one voice. So after, so to, to piggyback on what this is really about, right? You know, I, I try not to get too close to administration because you got to have enough separation to make decisions that you don't become complicit with the process, right? But you got to be close enough to work with it. It's an ebb and flow, <coughs> right? So I'm, I'm saying on this, for District 2's one vote, when um, after our conversation at the end of last year, and um, you know, with the, with the transition uh, of the new commissioner, and we had that meeting that was set up at the beginning of the year to take a look at this. And I said, okay, I, all right, let me go look at this and see what's really going on. I looked at this thing and I looked at, wait a minute, the lowest bid is what? How you gonna clean this building? They made four presentations. Y'all know how I do in my committees. Right, I'm gonna make presentations. I wanna see you. I wanna, I wanna hear you. Right, so you had a presentation. Just to confirm, we have, you know, I, I don't know, so I want to see you. I mean, I get what they did, but I need my comfort. I need to see you directly. So you came in, you had to make your, everybody had the same presentation time frame. I asked my same questions as you guys know I do, which each group, I'm consistent. And I'm listening to this thing and I'm looking at that like, okay, so low as a bit, like, how you gonna clean that courthouse with this? And it was one of those where that's just me and that's just to my colleagues. My, my conclusion is that, no, I don't, I don't believe in this, <clears throat> right? I'm not saying there was anything that had to do with staff. I'm just saying I wouldn't have voted for them. I would have, like, no, that would just been my vote, right? So it, that, that's important to recognize that we, we have the right to make a decision on how we believe. Now, it's also our authority to be able to get into the process and make sure we're comfortable with what we're, what we're listening to. And what we got it, when I got into this is that there's not much there, right? He has statute, he has authority, but it's like, no, there's nothing there, though. It's, it, it gets to get moved however <coughs> it wants to. And so now we're about to get a little bit more, more formal with this uh, because there was no qualifying. 
there was no no formalization. We're not saying that it was wrong, but it's just the way we think and the way it was done, there's disparity, there's a disconnect. And so we're like, we're trying to tighten up that and say, okay, let's look at this a little bit deeper. But but I, I think at this point, um, Commissioner Carthen, to Commissioner Mitchell's point, and I'm sure your pleasure, let's not belabor this. Mm -hmm. um, just because of where we're at, we've been having this conversation, it's just, all right, it's, it's too far to throw it away. I wouldn't have voted for it just because I didn't believe that Lois bid. Um, um, not for that, not just what was presented on their data alone. Like he said, well, this is what they wrote. Remember his last meeting said, well, I only gave y'all what they wrote, all right? I looked at what they wrote, what the presentation was, and I'm like, absolutely not, all right? And it, it's that simple, it's that easy, what they were presented. So Madam Chair, um, I'll, 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 I'll yield to however you guys want to put this on the agenda tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm just not comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Chair, yeah. the board wouldn't necessarily have to take action on item 14. Y'all could just say, you could just say, I'm removing this agenda item if you chose to do that. But you'd have to take off the table the prior agenda item. And just from following up, the Commissioner Mitchell, there's already a tabled item that was a rejection of the bids, I think, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may need to be clarified this rejection with a motion to approve a rebidding. <coughs> but item 14 could just be removed and replaced with the table item, and it'd have in parentheses tabled. And to deal with it, you'd have to remove it from the table, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Yes. What we'll do is just remove it. Um, Jennifer, as he just stated in, and we'll just state the verbiage as such tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yeah. At your pleasure. Well, we had table uh, previously. As your and then we'll just remove this item yeah. today. And you couldn't change it in today's meeting, the actual table, however it's written. Just so if you're adding to it, the rebidding, if it's not already in that language, somebody by motion would have to do that as part of the dealing with that item. Okay. And it's a separate item too. Okay. I, I don't want it to consent agenda. Yeah, you have it. It'd be new business. New business. Yes. Okay. Be old business. Okay. Old business. Yes. Old business. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay. Sure, so like we're moving down the right path. Okay. You know, one question. One question. One question. Yes. We have the cleaning company that's here now, but they're cleaning based on a price for more square footage. Mm -hmm. We don't want to waste the taxpayer's dollars. So what do we do? Because this was for less square footage. Right, right. And uh, we know that, but we're just hoping that your process will be ex expedited, hopefully within 30 to 60 days. So really, you have the ball in your court. And when we push it forward, then that check, that price will change. We're not wasting money. What we're trying to do is also do two things, uh, preserve um, um, perception, uh, make sure that we're transparent, and I believe we can do that. If you all can move quickly, I, I'm going to uh, charge the Purchasing uh, Oversight Committee and also he's me, uh, Purchasing Director stepped out. So you all can just move the process along quickly. And we may have this resolved within the next 30 days. Okay? okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? We're going to move on to the next item, which is tab number 15, authorization to enter into a business service order agreement with Comcast for installation of a line of <coughs> service at a cost of $199 with a monthly service fee of $87.60 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Dukes, I love this price. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this one. Smallest thing on the uh, <laughs> <laughs> We've had uh, cable at the old courthouse for years mm -hmm. and uh, a couple of months ago it stopped working so we uh, contacted <coughs> Comcast and they said uh, the service had been disabled is what they said mm -hmm. so uh, we did a little research but couldn't find out why it was disabled uh, and they don't know until they come out and uh, troubleshoot it uh, so we're asking that uh, you allow them to come out and enter into a contract and uh, have service. We have funding in the budget for the bill. Uh, okay. We use this to monitor all of the weather, bad weather, uh, severe weather that might come into the area. We use it to uh, cancel activities. Uh, we have tornadic activity or lightning or thunderstorms or whatever. Uh, this gives us the ability to do it in real time and uh, closed parks, shut down parks, we need to. Okay, thank you. Commission, we have a question for you, Director Deuce, Commissioner Guider. Well, it, it's not <coughs> clear as to where the line is, is going to be installed. Is it to the old courthouse? Yes. 
Okay. Is that our all? We should it not say that in the agenda item. Yeah, uh, it, it just says to install a new line. It doesn't say where. So yeah. I was kind of confused as to what if they were going to send it to all the parks or what. No, <laughs> it's just just our office. Oh, 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 oh. okay. And we'll, we'll add that language for tomorrow, that. Commissioner. Thank you. Thank okay. you. You're back. All right, any other questions? I'll move on to the next tab. Tab number 16, authorization to accept a BCBSGA wellness, <coughs> I mean health and wellness program funds in the amount of $16,000 for continued uh, implementation of 2018-2019 Douglas County Employee Wellness Series and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget, Director Perry. Yes, ma'am, that's Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia has afforded us, Madam Chair, some uh, program funds to help continue to push our wellness initiative here in the county. We have been able to, uh, uh, to implement several different programs that we're very happy with, and uh, a bunch of learns, and uh, uh, we have actually two health fairs that will be coming up. Uh, Madam Chair, you, you uh, one of the big proponents of the yoga that we have going on as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, they provided some funds for us to continue that effort. And uh, some of those funds will go towards uh, 2018, but some will be applied towards the 2019 uh, programs that we have as well. So uh, we're hopeful that, uh, you know, as we continue to push this wellness, initi wellness initiative, that it will have a profound effect on the uh, cost for our benefits uh, program as well. So uh, that has yet to be determined and yet to be seen. But we figure that, uh, you know, these things are, you, you, you can't go wrong with the things that we have in place. So just want the, uh, the board to receive these funds, amend the budget so we can move forward with, uh, with our plan. Okay, any questions from the board? All right, thank you. I'll move on to the next item. Um, discussion items. We have uh, economic development incubators and accelerators. accelerators uh, uh, Executive Director Humphrey, would you like to come up and tell us about this item? Tab number 17. <coughs> Sarah, are you with me? Are you good? Okay. Good afternoon. Last time it was good morning. Now it's good afternoon. Um, <laughs> it's actually a lot warmer over here. It's freezing against that wall. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just Mondo Pat creating all this heat back here. So I um, wanted to discuss something. It's, it's really kind of ties into the broad breadth of, of economic development. And I want to make sure each of you have one of these. Um, you know, as you know, it's it's traditional that um, us and the development authority that we only work uh, large projects. I got another one. Does everybody have one? All right. So um, it's you know typical that you know it's assumed that all we do is work on uh, large projects. Um, but we don't. And one of the things that is essential to a healthy economy um, is a thriving small business and entrepreneurial sector. So um, what we've done through our strategic plan, um, I believe many of you were at when we did the unveiling last fall, or last summer actually, um, was we laid out our four pillars. And those pillars were built on uh, how do we better market uh, Douglas County internally and externally, how we invest with intention. So talking about things like the investment into Lee Road and business parks and things like that. Um, cultivating talent, the presentation you had um, at the last meeting was kind of hitting on our workforce components um, and building business success, which is dealing with the target sectors that we're going after, the recruitment of industry into the community, supporting our existing business space, and then finally, uh, entrepreneurial and small business activity. So what I um, what I handed out to you is a is a segment of um, one of the reports we got in our plan, um, and that was a competitive assessment. And this was about a 174 page slide deck. And what I did was I pulled out the, the component that focused on the entrepreneurship and innovation. And the, the, there was this was a, a really telling um, piece of uh, and component of our strategic planning efforts. And so what it did was it, it laid out um, the, the stats about what's happening in our, in, with entrepreneurs here in, in Douglas County. 
and really how we compare to other communities, whether that was compared to the region, the Metro Atlanta region, the nation, and even some of our benchmark communities. And so um, it was very telling in the fact that we were, we were going in the wrong direction um, as it related to that. And a lot of, as we know, we had the huge housing boom and then subsequent decline as we were vastly affected here locally. And you know, a lot of our kind of comeback, we all said, well, everything was tied to the economy. <clears throat> Everyone's in a recession, and so we're, we're held back. Which for us was, was partly true, because we were kind of the, the lagging community to grow in the region. And so we grew really fast, um, and we failed really fast. So it was really hard to come back. And we didn't have a strong base around us to really kind of come back <coughs> and down, um, very quickly and easily. Um, but, but what we also recognize that we didn't have is we didn't have the infrastructure in place to support um, small, um, small business um, in, in the right way. So when it comes to things like micro businesses, whereas the Atlanta Metro increased over a five year span by 2.8%, we decreased by 3.2%. Um, um, the, the growth in, in the micro businesses, and those are 10 or smaller, you know, even when we compare to our benchmark communities, we were, we were lagging. Um, we were better than Ellis County, Texas, but yet we were still lagging. Um, and so, you know, this was a really kind of an eye-opening piece. And then what came, what came from this was the SWOT analysis uh, that you see uh, in the document as well. And you probably have to go back about uh, 15 pages or so, but you'll see um, uh, this, this uh, di diagram here. Yeah. And it really lays out um, the, a SWOT analysis for innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, laying out our strengths, um, you know, in that we had a high rate of self-employment um, compared to the U.S. average. Um, patent production uh, in Douglas County is less than the Atlanta Metro uh, Georgia area and U.S. average, but um, it's still impressive given the size of the community. Um, some of our weaknesses on a proportional basis, Douglas County is home to fewer businesses that employ 10 or fewer employees. Self-employed individuals um, in Douglas County earn significantly less than their counterparts in the Atlanta metro region. And in a survey of regional site consultants, real estate professionals, respondents rated Douglas County's environment um, for resources for entrepreneurs is, is just average. So the resources in the community being average. Um, a threat that we have um, is that the number of micro businesses in Douglas County remains below pre-recession levels. And as the number of micro businesses in the Atlanta Metro has increased in recent years, <coughs> Douglas County may, may not be attracting enough entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So we're, we don't have that base in place. So our consultant on the last page laid out um, some, uh, some action items for us to undertake. And, and it's, it's within our Build Business Success Pillar. Um, and it's, it's, high, it's titled, Continue to Enhance Support Systems for Entrepreneurs and Startups. <coughs> um, and so that deals with expanding small business and entrepreneurship programs. Part of that we started in partnership with the Chamber last year. Um, and Mercer University, <coughs> we started a program called Co-Starters. Um, and it was a nine week cohort for aspiring entrepreneurs or maybe those who were just gotten into business, really giving them the foundational tools to be successful and, and really say, is this really what you want to do? Um, so really giving them the, that, that, that skill set. Um, and then that is translated into other programs that are now taking place um, that are being led uh, through the, the support of Mercer. And we're looking forward to doing another one of those cohort programs. So that is a, that is a step um, towards uh, continuing to enhance um, our support systems. One of the things that's also in there, which is a kind of second major heading, is the establishment of an entrepreneurial hive where startup businesses can learn, invest, and grow in Douglas <coughs> County. And uh, that is, is, is identified as a primary responsibility um, of, of the Chamber. Sarah Ray, a President and CEO of the Chamber, is here uh, today um, in bringing on a number of partners to, to do that and really looking to kind of start that in 2019. So we started it from some of our components in 2018. It's 2019, it's kind of like that next phase, next evolution. And so part of that is the conducting a feasibility study to determine the perfect mix of space and services that will energize startups in Douglas <coughs> County's 
target sec target industries to locate and grow. This could be a blend of an accelerator and maker spaces. And so that was kind of an, an objective that was outlined through the consultant um, uh, by Avalanche and looking to do something like that this year. Mm -hmm. um, prior to my coming on board um, in Douglas County, uh, which is a long time now, I feel, um, was uh, the, the county did a, a study on incubators and accelerators um, uh, by a firm uh, called Be Next. And so uh, that plan, that study was laid out. Um, like I said, that was prior to my coming here. And, you know, after kind of looking through right, our strategy and the things that we need to accomplish, you know, felt that one, it was good to come back to you as a board of commissioners to kind of, kind of revisit this component of the strategy. I know when we sent it out, it's a big strategy and who has the time to read through all of that. But when you take the bits and pieces and really start to see how the pieces come together, it's you know taking a look at do we come back and maybe redo or take a relook um, at, at that study um, and, and see about you know how we can take what was done I guess eight nine years ago now 2010 uh, nine years ago now um, and then kind of bring that back to date now based off new data that we have and really understanding community needs as a whole how can we move something like that forward so that's kind of what I wanted to bring um, but before you as commissioners um, to, to, to one, think about and then take a consi consideration of, of, of redoing um, that, that analysis. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you have a comment. You have a yeah. um, I, I appreciate it. And I'll, I'll just, just to thank you, Chris, for that very good overview. And I appreciate the document. You're very good. Mm -hmm. um, as far as framing, uh, again, I'm going to back up um, for a minute. Coming through the recession, um, coming out of the office in 09, um, we're in a different place. And again, it was always about the economy. Um, I knew that you had to, uh, it's about small business. Big business only gets to be a big business because they had to be a small business to begin with. Um, if you really look at the statistics, 51%, over 51% of all new jobs in America is created by what? Small business. Small businesses. Right, so, uh, so here we are in the middle of a recession. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm brand new, I'm full of zeal. And I, I began to advocate small business. And uh, while we did um, take on a study, I, I don't think we quite got it, right? We, to your point, it have been validated. We didn't get it as administration. Uh, we, we thought the jail would be what? An economic development generator, right? That, that was the words that were used. And it's like, well, I get that. And while I get the guys who got the contracts, tier one, tier two, tier three, most of the local guys, I mean, they were just workers as part of a bigger system, but nobody really had um, independence. Nobody got to sort of uh, be their own boss and stuff. And so I, I <coughs> it was one of those that just was, I was probably before my time. And the Commissioner Mitchell was always putting up, when you gonna bring that back, when you gonna bring that back. Uh, I, but I wanted to make sure it was the right time. Uh, because again, we do a great job of doing big business economic development, we really do. And while only a few of those companies, if you look at the wall of fame and <coughs> economic development, uh, you know, maybe what, 15 companies, 20 at tops might have, you know, benefit from tax incentives, et cetera, uh, I think that more could be done for the small guy, who really is the backbone, who really, you know, we, we should spend more time with. Um, and, and so my job was to try to at least create an atmosphere in which at least we can have consideration. Uh, I think the timing is right because now there has been a shift in the county. Uh, it's just not about the old guys who had, you know, sort of that always get the contracts, only get this. It was time to break this thing up. And like, okay, well, what about the small guy? And giving them a chance to get in the game and, and get resources, et cetera. So uh, what I saw was um, a lot of good work, Sarah. Uh, I mean, everybody was doing a great job as far as moving us forward, but I wanted to make sure that we looked at the bigger picture and really um, put some concentrated effort. I support this bringing forth um, um, as far as a consultant taking it to the next level, Madam Chair, um, it makes sure I address you, um, specifically to that point, but to fulfill a bigger picture, which is, it's great to talk about it, <coughs> and uh, it is great to have um, plans, right? But at the end of the day, you want to grow up to a point where you're actually able to pay taxes. <coughs> so there's a small business that's called, in my mind, um, an independent contributor. Yes, they're their own job, but they, they, they do their write-offs and so forth. But we want to get to a point where your company is actually can be accelerated to a point where you actually can pay taxes, right? Think about it. I can write off all day long for four, five, six, seven years, right? Right? 
So, uh, it, so there's a, there's a there's a push to say we need to grow. It's not just being dependent on the switches, right? You know, some of our commentary we're gonna ride. I'm like, no, come on now. Uh, everybody should have their equal share for contribution, right? Everybody, but but think about this, and this is just for context. Um, Sarah, what was it? Uh, well, no, <coughs> Breezy gave me some some data. I think there's what we have ninety five thousand uh, people that are uh, ba basically eligible for work here in Davis <coughs> County. All right, we got 142,000 citizens, 35,000 are in K through 12, right? Keep it simple, so that's about 100, not including little babies and stuff, right? So roughly about 95,000 are eligible for 25 years and above, right? All right, and we have what, uh, uh, un unemployment rate of what? Three something, mm -hmm. right? All right, so 100,000, 3%, so that means that, um, think about, we're not talking about that many people, right? Um, that would be eligible for entrepreneurship. But it's not just those people who are unemployed. It's those people who are underemployed. It's those people who are in their second season of life uh, who want to retire. It's, it's a lot of people who are eligible. So I want to make sure we're targeting the right group. That is everybody who may want to um, take on that risk. But it's time to move forward. Everything is not just me. America is just not working for somebody. I, I don't believe that. <coughs> America is just not about going to work for somebody. America was built on pioneering. When it broke, across, uh, broke off from England, it, you know what America is. America is about business, <coughs> right? It's about you being able to do your own destiny. And I think all citizens of this country should have that opportunity and not just be pushed to go work for somebody else, right? Everybody should have an opportunity to sort of be their own boss and, and have their own independent American dream. So, again, this is just from my perspective of what I think is important. So, I, I joined the amateur as a, as a sponsor of this, and so I'm with the floor, but I support what they want to put on the agenda to move forward to the next one. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Geiger. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> Chris, could you explain what an incubator is uh, as far as business is concerned? What does an incubator do to create business? Sure. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's there to create business. It's basically there to take existing business and really give it the necessary tools and support system to help that business be sustainable and then to help it grow. But it's not necessarily to create it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I've always advocated that, that you know we have the abatements for the large corporations and we have the free port <coughs> for uh, a lot of the distribution centers and everything and the opportunities of them down, down on Thornton Road. But uh, I don't see why, has anybody ever considered giving a higher exemption on personal property, which is their inventory and things like that? Um, to the small business, right now the state of Georgia allows six. 7,000, I think, unless it's changed since I've been in there. Exemption on your inventory. But could we not raise that at a local level and let that be a local exemption? Uh, lowering taxes helps to grow business. It affects everybody. So have we? Have you looked at anything like that? We, we have not looked at any of the, the, the tools, incentives, and, and things. And, and, and I'll, you know, to that point, Prior to this strategy, really small business had not been a focus of ours. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we've we've learned through under, through the data and what have you that we really need to do a lot. i um, actually just got back from taking a class uh, week before last, learning about all of these things about accelerators and incubators <coughs> and all the different support programs to help grow and spark entrepreneurial activity. And there, there's a lot. I mean, and I think through this process, we'll start discovering what those opportunities are be able to study the policy to see what are the, the pros and cons, how do you evaluate it, how do you put it in place. But I think there's a ton of opportunities and policy recommendations that we could bring before the board to mm -hmm. take under consideration. I wish you would consider that part of raising mm -hmm. the personal property exemption for sure. small businesses and everything. Because, <coughs> I mean, it's been proven over and over that when you lower taxes, business grows. Yeah. So, uh, and it affects everybody. It's not just a handful of people here and there. It's everybody that does business and it gives <coughs> them the perception that Douglas County is a good place to do business, exactly. to open a business and everything. 
So I'd like for us to look at that to see if we can do that at a local level. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have local exemptions on homestead and, and things like that. <coughs> and as I said, we've got 100% on Freeport mm -hmm. of things shipped out of the state. Mm -hmm. So why not look at something for the little fellow? Yeah, you're so right. I, I'd yeah. like to see y'all uh, pursue that. We'll do it. Okay. I yield back. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mitchell. Just one, Chris. Um, first of all, and, and, and as Commissioner Robson stated, we always, every now and then, I'll tap him on the shoulder about the incubators and <coughs> about the whole nation. Where are you guys looking at, I don't know how far down the road are we with this possibility, but where are you guys looking at even housing this, or how you, I mean, how far how far down the road are you guys with this? I mean, I'm glad that you guys are sure. now revisiting it, because I think it's about time, yeah. you know, but. I mean, I, I, think, I, I think space is a, is a part of the process. Okay. Um, I don't think it's a leader. Because um, sometimes you can you can lead with the wrong with you don't right size it. I can, I can agree so you got to right size it for whatever your programs are. Okay. So once you get your programs in place, what are your opportunities and what have you? I think okay. then we go to we go to location second. Got it. So so you're working on the programming side of it. Mm -hmm. um, whom uh, what that is from doing your taxes to doing the <coughs> shit to you know just understanding is this really what you want to do? Mm -hmm. Do you really want to be an entrepreneur? Correct. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. That's the stage of where you guys are, and that could be done kind of in those classes or those types of situations could be done anywhere. Could be done. Well, well it, it's it, it's studying the 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 scope of actually having an incubator. What all goes into having an incubator? Yes. Okay. What are the tools you need here? I kind of. It's a step up above talking to the actual entrepreneur. Okay. It's actually what are the support programs we need to have in place. Yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, we kind of, I think what you're talking about is kind of the, after we've gotten the location, talking to the entrepreneur okay. Um, okay. and what have you. So we're, we're doing some of those things now with some of our programs, you know, that we're offering in kind of conjunction with Mercer, but nothing that's keenly focused on a company being in a space part of a program Understood. and going through Understood. a specific, um, uh, what am I trying to say, matriculation. Right, right. Yeah. So also, are there, because uh, I would just ask, are there any, I mean, you, I don't know who would be those uh, instructors or facilitators or whomever that may or may not be. You probably got some people in mind. Are there some, are you in need of anybody of that caliber? I, I mean, the question of, remains too though, what type of business and a whole lot of stuff go into all of this to decide on what those individuals are and who they are. Yeah. But there's, there's some folk out there that would like to even volunteer or be a part of this process. How could they get engaged? Yeah, I mean, you would, um, I don't have the answer to that question yet, but, but you would definitely want, you know, entrepreneurs successful entrepreneurs yes you know yes. to be the ones kind of leading that there's there's a there's a component for academia mm -hmm. but then there's also a strong uh, need for real world real yes. life experience Agreed. to be able to to speak to one of the things we also want to be able to um, we've got to be focused you know this isn't going to be a program for everyone um, this isn't going to be like you know the whole world is we're going to be able to serve everybody we can't do it um, part of one of the things that we laid out in the strategy was really trying to build upon those sectors within our target sector okay um, so there's there's programs and things that we can that we can offer for everyone but not everyone's going to be necessarily the incubator bookie you, know, you can offer for everybody right you know, right, you know, right. But, but specific when you start trying to get into mm -hmm. the nuts and bolts of it, it it gets a little bit more yeah i, I kind of like what is our a lane that we're going to try to stay in. I don't yeah. know. So, any idea what that lane may or may not be, though? So, so you know, I would, and not being the expert, I would kind of start with where our target sectors are. Okay. So, our target sectors are in the areas of advanced manufacturing, professional services okay. and technology, okay. media, and entertainment. I ideally would want to start there, but I'm not a professional. So, you know, we would go there. But looking at companies who, you know, we could see, you know, growing. Mm -hmm. And you know, becoming you know like high growth you know companies, I would say are probably more your incubator mm -hmm. um, um, prospects mm -hmm. um, per se. But then you know, there's other programs that we'll ha continue to put in place, which we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Like for example, co-starters that was open to anyone. Mm -hmm. We didn't restrict it to a certain sector. Mm -hmm. We just said anyone and everyone who wants to go through this is open to doing that, mm -hmm. and we'll continue to do it that way until we feel that we do need to break it down to target sector. Understood. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you back? Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Parker. 
My question to you, Chris, is would you look at bringing in some of the target sectors that we have? Would you look at bringing in some of those businesses to help those entrepreneurs? Oh, yeah. Like a switch or like a... Yeah, definitely. And, and actually, I, I look to switch to be a huge partner in this. Um, <coughs> as a, um, in all of their other centers, especially the one we had the chance to visit in L.A., um, they, they're not LA, Las Vegas. Um, they sponsored um, uh, an innovation center, and it's all about entrepreneurial activity. Um, and in that segment, they're supporting tech companies um, in, in that in that center. Uh, but I definitely look forward to them being a partner in this. Google as well. Um, they're all about you know creating entrepreneurs. They're all about minorities in STEM. All of these different areas. And we definitely want to pull on our existing base uh, to help pull this together. So in doing that, it would create a larger footprint for Douglas County with other people oh, yeah. coming here. So mm -hmm. it's a win-win on all yeah. sides of yeah. the equation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you start to see the evolution of all, how everything that what we do, I would say, is tied to economic development from mm -hmm. the land use plan we just discussed mm -hmm. not too long ago um, to all the decisions that you're making <coughs> regarding purchasing. I mean, all of these things are all kind of intertwined together. And I think this is just an area that we have not put enough attention into um, for in our community. Oh, yeah, thank you. <coughs> yeah. Okay, Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, I mean, just to, and again, I, I think, and again, we'll get into this to, to sort of the uh, Madam Guider's point of, of making sure we're properly educated on the difference between an incubator and accelerator, uh, making sure we highlight that university participation is important. Um, obviously, we know that's access to research dollars. You know, I'm always about <coughs> capital stack. I'm always about, okay, how are these guys going to grow? It's not always about going to get the loan in debt. There's other ways to raise money, equity. There's a whole different conversation that needs to be had for <coughs> that small guy. Um, you know, if you ever watch Shark Tank, it's a great learning tool when it first came out. Um, but it's something, it's about atmosphere. And it's how to really, really, really grow. And uh, But there's a bigger um, ecosystem that needs to be put in place. So. Uh, I guess, is there an ask for the public? There is an ask on the table to engage a consultant to move this forward, Chris? Yeah, my, my ask would be to just go back to the, the consultant that we had before, um, who did the initial incubator study, to kind of redo that study. That would be the firm B Next, um, sorry, <coughs> B Next Entrepreneurs. Um, and they would kind of go in to redo the study, um, you know, kind of laying out that what incubators and accelerators are, kind of being that educator, that coach, um, identifying what our market area is, what our potential is, um, uh, model, do an, an analysis, look at to Commissioner, I'll just look for him, I guess he stepped out, Commissioner Mitchell's point about space, um, right. uh, the financial <coughs> analysis, who are all the stakeholders, <coughs> what kind of governance would need to be put in place, really kind of giving all of the things that you would need to have in place in order to actually enact uh, through this. And we were kind of at a certain point decide, hey, you're right, we actually do meet the test, we can actually do this, and then we'll just start going down that, that path. Um, Is this less than $75,000 to accomplish this? Yes. Right. So um, they, they, they have uh, provided a proposal, um, kind of a, a, a refresh of the proposal. Um, it would be a total, uh, a total compensation of $50,000, um, a, a $25,000 deposit, um, as, which is basically paid as a retainer, the one-time fee, um, and then, uh, then upon completion of the plan, um, which is another $25,000, um, so a total of $50,000 with twenty-five dollars up front and twenty five dollars after completion of what their deliverables. <coughs> Well, Chris, uh, could you clarify who pays? Uh, Commissioner Guyton just had a question regarding who would pay this. It would be the county. Is that what you're proposing? It, it would be the county. You can do it as a direct to, or we can do it. We would kind of be in conjunction through our partnership with the neighbor, kind of being uh, overseeing that. So it could be done as a direct, or it could be done through as a pass through. Okay. Okay. Are you, did you yield back, Commissioner Ross? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, since so y'all took the flow from no, me, no, I just, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'll roll with you. I'm good. You good? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I would just uh, like to say, of course, <coughs> this is, is a, a huge step, and we would love to move in the right direction uh, because small businesses are the heartbeat of America, and we want to be in the game. Um, we definitely want to seize the moment. Uh, this is an opportunity. Uh, certainly, we've already kicked off with co-starters. 
I did have conversations with Sarah when she attended sh the Chamber Initiative in Washington when we had our flock member fly in and asked her to touch bases to see what, what the, the footprint looks like out there in terms of what they're doing. And I'd certainly take it back off what Commissioner Guy is saying regarding property tax exemptions, something personal property tax exemptions. That would be something because what we want to do is incentivize our small businesses. That's very critical <coughs> to this point. And then also, I just wanted to make sure that we capture those bis small businesses that are here, too, as well. We don't want to leave them out. Okay. So we want to pull in the new with the, the, old, the old and the new together and then just revamp that. It sounds like there's an opportunity for us to revamp our entire system. So I'm good to, uh, I'm excited to see that this is uh, back on the table again. Uh, and uh, looks forward to some exciting things that we've done <coughs> out the past. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chairman has yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, just wanted to clarify. So just for, because this is a discussion item, we're putting this on the agenda for tomorrow in a new business. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question. Then second question is where do y'all want the money coming from? Yeah. Contingency? Yeah. Because it's not in the budget. It's contingency. Why not an economic splash? Maybe it's too far to Yeah. Is that economic? We check that. That's economic development category is listed under transportation so it's right. part of transportation mm -hmm. <coughs> technically this is not transportation related mm -hmm. oh. so I, my initial thought is no we can't pay for it out of school well wait wait back up <coughs> i mean consultants we pay for out of that was strategy that's a good point let's take it offline come back tomorrow yeah right. take it off. offline okay. but, but duly noted where it's coming from okay yeah we'll we'll pull it with us but duly noted but just on the agenda tomorrow, new business item, and I'm sure we'll make sure we work to get you the proper source. Yes. Okay. All right. Last but not least, uh, we have uh, some board appointments in our <coughs> meeting. I believe that will be in our executive mm -hmm. session. Um, really, any other comments before the board of commissioners before I call for the executive mm -hmm. session? Uh, Attorney Bernard, do we uh, need to go into executive session? We do, Madam Chair, for personnel and litigation. Okay. Board of commissioners, do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Yep. I got We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, stay 10 minutes and come back. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have any other questions or concerns? Well, regarding this meeting, any other comments? Okay, with that being said, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.